Unstoppable Confidence. If you're serious about gaining more confidence, you must get this book, Robert Allen, The One Minute Millionaire. This wonderful book will give you the boost towards success that you can make all the difference. Brian Tracy. Imagine having the confidence and courage to go after your goals, successful career. Part 1. Getting into gear. Why confidence matters. Without self-confidence, we are babes in the cradle. Virginia Woolf. Confidence matters more than almost anything else determining our success. Therefore, it's necessary that and to understand exactly how important it is. Why confidence is important? Confidence is vital because it's the difference that makes the difference. When people consistently take action to make the appropriate course corrections, they get massive results and achieve all their goals. However if, however, if they lack the confidence to take action, they will stay stuck. It would be no different than if they had no dreams or no goals at all. And after all, what's the point of wishing for anything if you don't pursue it? Having confidence, especially when it comes to having the ability to communicate, is absolutely essential. Without it, people don't communicate effectively. The degree from which you are confident and communicate well with others is the degree from which you will succeed in life, no matter what context you're referring to. Business, family, friends, in which you'll experience in your career and so on. It is directly proportional to the degrees from which you will experience a rewarding and fulfilling life. We are naturally drawn to confident people. Imagine what it would be like to have people coming up just wanting to meet you simply because you're so confident that you automatically make an impression in their minds of being somebody different. Imagine how it feels to exude attractive energy, one that radiates out with and attracts people to you. Confident people appear to be more credible. Being confident will immediately turbocharge your success in the business and relationships because you will come across more credible. If people ask you a question, you look at him or her straight in the eye, you have confidence and physiology, answering with an authoritative tone. It took a few blown real estate deals for me to learn this lesson the hard way. After all, if you don't project that you believe in yourself, how are investors supposed to believe in you? Confidence can make your dreams come true. Right now, as I write this book, I'm actually dictating it into an audio cassette recorder on a beautiful Thursday afternoon in Oregon, and I hear geese quacking in the background. It's a beautiful blue sky reflecting off a lovely pond. It's it's a puffy cloud kind of day, and there you want to relax and enjoy yourself, but it is because of using these techniques I'm prescribing that I'm going to be able to do so. My journey to unstoppable confidence. Now, before you think I was always this confident, let me tell you my story. I share this miserable tale of shyness and let you know that no matter how shy or unconfident you are now, you can improve and become more confident. My shy self. I had always been a shy child, continuing to shy as into my shy young adult. I had a small select group of close friends my entire life. I've never found enough confidence to introduce myself to strangers and it led to a serious difficulties for me in dating re and having relatings to women. And my friends and I excelled in school. It was our main focus, yet in the back of my mind I knew that I was missing out on something when all the other people in high school were going out on dates. I thought to myself, man, it must be different. Or what that something must be what's that something that must be wrong with me? Consequently I found myself rationalizing that I could be a great Lothario. Lothario, if I chose to, but in the main area of concentration and excellence was school. However, deep down, I secretly desired to trade places with some of the other kids just to experience what it was like to go out on a date and even be comfortable with someone of the opposite sex. And more I thought about it and how much fun they were having, hanging out and having a normal teenage experiences, the worse I felt about myself. And it was as if I lacked the ability to really connect with other people on a deep level. Searching for the new way to escape, I turned my studying event harder into burying myself in the books, and at that time, it was all I knew how to do. Now, in reflection, I can easily see that there were other choices available at the time, and we always have options, and it's important to be able to recognize many of these possible, and then naturally decide for ourselves which option suits us best. In four years of high school, I went to exactly one date. One, of course, it wasn't from who I initiated it. The girl approached me, asked me one day, and asked me if I wanted to hang out with her one night. Smiling broadly and trying to contain my overwhelming enthusiasm as incredible, unprecedented event, I gladly accepted. Later in the week, she called me, and then we set the date, and following Friday, and the night came, she picked me up, and we went to a fast food restaurant nearby all throughout the dinner. The conversation was strained as she tried her best to pry my looseness, to pry me loose from my shell, and everything that began that came out of the shell, I automatically retreated back into it simply because of my dreadful habit of shyness. She did her absolute best to talk with me and have a good time. Still, I couldn't tell that she I couldn't tell she saw my shyness as an obstacle to getting to know each other. And my saving grace was that I smiled a lot and replicated every question she asked me. The conversation went better as long as she did the talking. After we finished dinner, she drove us up to the mountains. We had a lookout where a lookout point with a beautiful view of the city and I was clear in a clear night sky with the stars illuminating high. 
She asked me for suggestions on what I wanted to do, but I was too shy to suggest anything for the fear of rejection. I didn't really understand the meaning of this field trip. Only later did I learn from high school that other friends had place was other other high school friends that the place we went to was the designated makeout spot. While I was able to maintain good eye contact with the young lady, sometimes there was pauses in the conversation that seemed like an eternity to me, and at these times my internal dialogue came alive as if it were a gnawing young sibling whose life mission was to prevent me from enjoying myself. Does she want me to kiss her? What if I have a gunk in my teeth? What if I kiss her and should I do it? Does she really like me? Is she bored with me? What should I say next? Why are why are we really here? What does it mean? What should I do next? Do I look at the stars outside the car with her, or should I hold her hand? My goodness, she sure is pretty. Is this is she noticing me, turning red and with embarrassment? How come I'm so darn shy? Do I want to kiss her? What should I do? When should I do it? The internal dialogue continued on, as like for an, inter an entire night. No wonder I could not hold a conversation with her. How could I when I was so busy having conversations with myself? None of my attention was left over to talk to her. After an hour or more forced conversation, we finally, she finally dropped me off at home and offered a handshake lieu of repeating one of my previous awkward episodes. Though the high school gossip grapevine, I found out that the young woman had recently broken up with her long-term boyfriend immediately called me out. And I was wondering if it was really coincidence that she had gone to the restaurant where he had worked... Was she hoping he'd be there? My ultimate conclusion was that she was just trying to make him jealous and have me find out about the date, even though she did not have any interest in me. People thought of my inaction as unwillingness to initiate activity, and others was because I was so antisocial, aloof, indecisive, reactive, and generally unfriendly. What I found most painful was is that I wanted to be social, proactive, decisive, and friendly. Only at the time, I didn't know how. That was the most frustrating part, behaving as if I was trapped in a shell and unable to do or be who I really was all along. Then in my college years, now as you've read the unshyest, the ultra shyness of high school, you may be thinking that this couldn't get any worse, and it did. One night, a few too many beers and my roommates and the friends spotted me screwing around on the computer and decided to get me to loosen up. Their mission thenceforth was to get me drunk as a skunk. They proceeded to apply some very persuasive peer pressure, invited me upstairs. Patty was being where the party was being held, being flattered that they even recognized me, I finally said yes and resolutely stated and I would have a drink though. After getting upstairs and getting into the midst of the party, one of the generous roommates handed me an orange juice and said, drink it up. It's a stage of gratitude for all the attention I chugged it. The next thing I knew, I was feeling tipsy, really relaxed, and my lips wouldn't stop moving. I was having lots of fun, though I was eventually realizing it was a semi-drunken stupor. I figured out that the orange juice was spiked with alcohol. However, I was finally feeling accepted, so I chose to drink some more, and it was my first experience with alcohol. I found out I quite liked being able to drink to the point of obvious in a, in a brief inebriation since it allowed me to relax and stop being so shy temporarily. After the great first drinking experience, I decided that I liked it and I did a lot more. Then when the weekend came, I talked to a number of people to find out where the party was being held. Once the party, I proceeded to get seriously drunk. My faulty logic, my faulty logic was that if one beer was good, then two beers was even better. My following this logic, and by following it, I was drunk in no time, and I simultaneously, I transformed myself into a shy wallflower who spoke to no one into a raving, whirling dervish of humorous drunk who spoke to people, told jokes, laughed out loud and long, and had a great time. But it was at these parties that my friends had to tell me it was time to go home, but I never wanted to leave. This was my escape from the shyness, and I wanted to last all as long, long as possible. I needed it to last as long as I could make it. That was why I was metaphorically metaphorically playing the doctor, prescribing alcohol to myself and self-medication for my shyness. And at this point in time, you'd be wondering whether one of the unstoppable confidence techniques to get sloshed and drown out the shyness with alcohol. The answer is no. It's just that at that time I didn't realize that there was other ways to overcome shyness, and as a result of these parties I woke up in strange places, forgot what I had done previous nights before I was drunk, felt miserable, hangover, still in my mind. Drinking was my ticket out of shyness, and when I didn't realize, what I hadn't realized was that I had other options. But without these other options to be more confident, I did the best I could with what I knew, and at that, unfortunately, was to drink to excess. One day after having miserable hangover, I crossed the threshold and I knew it was time to stop. I decided that there was another way, and after all, I seen other people who behaved confidently without resorting to getting smashed, I decided I'd find out just what it was that they were doing. My search for solutions. 
My search for solutions began as I searching for answers. I found myself reading a number of self-help books from the self-help books gained in little knowledge, useful exercise, and enhanced my confidence in myself and allowed me to relax in, pre in the presence of others. Finally, I promised myself that I would become confident in whatever I wanted to do. And I was fiercely determined to gain confidence, ultimately in the experience of breaking out of my shell that, that made it possible. Specifically in the case, I was talking to women. I decided I would approach every single woman I saw. At first, it was simply smiling at them, and you, and you know what? They responded. Not all of them, but enough to encourage me to expand my comfort zone a little further. The small success catapulted me into the next step, expanding my comfort zone. Next, I would approach women and simply say hi. Again, the slight widening of my comfort zone encouraged me. And after all, I was an adult and had to take care of my confidence myself. I had two choices. I could either retreat back into my comfort zone and be shy, blaming someone else for making me that way, or I could take responsibility and go for it. Then my confidence really grew. I got to the point where I could meet women and gain instant rapport with them. Conversation with ease. Following your dreams. Following your dreams confidently ultimately gave me confidence ultimately gave me the ability to leave my job and start my own business. Confidence is what I needed to follow my dreams. I'm sure as you read this you can find your own reasons of why it's important for you to Go out and find your own dreams. Picture your idea of bliss. What does this look like? What does it sound like? Who are you with? How much fun are you having? What time are you getting up? What time do you go to sleep? How do you take a nap? Because you can? Do you take a nap because you can? No matter what your dreams are, when you use the techniques in this book, you'll develop an unstoppable confidence to go after those dreams and make them a reality. By keeping your vision in mind, by keeping your vision in mind, imagining it vividly and regularly, you automatically teach your unconscious mind to lead you to that day. And... Won't that day be wonderful? Chapter 2 Origins of Confidence Courage is resistance to fear, mastery of fear, not absence of fear. Mark Twain Up until now, how have you thought of yourself? Were you shy like I was? Were you tentative? Lack of confidence usually comes from one of the following areas. Lack of confidence usually comes from society at large, your parents, school in your peers, and then mass media. Well, in addition, you may have become shy because of hypersensitivity or even because you believe that you were born that way. In this chapter, we'll explore the reasons you may lack confidence in the process. We'll debunk the false premises behind these reasons. And if you have children, we'll discuss how you can prevent shyness from happening to them. You'll instill unstoppable confidence in them. Society. In many ways, society's conditions people to go with the flow or you better accept what is offered and not to make any waves or go against tradition. Well, sometimes and this is falsely interpreted as advice to not follow your dreams. If you need to step outside of what is normal or usual to pursue your dreams, then do that exactly. So society is not your influence. Parents. Parents can be a major contributor to your lack of confidence. Throughout life, their purpose is to teach their children to help them to experience their full potential, to be who they were meant to be. Yet sometimes, parents strip away the child's individuality and inadvertently instill what the child perceives you as limitations. Parents often try to get the kids on, on conform to the view of what they think is correct. And how many times have you heard these following phrases? Act like a grown-up. Stop acting childish, as if that were a bad thing. Be realistic, or get your head out of the clouds, and you're such a dreamer, or you can't do that. No one has ever done that before. Parents usually have positive intentions motivating their behavior, yet sometimes they don't communicate that. Take the phrase act, act like a grown-up. What does that mean? Well, to have all the limits most adults do. But not to play and experience pure joy like a child, to not learn, wonder, or explore. If that's acting like a grown-up, I'd rather pass. Or consider the phrase, stop acting childish. Well, the notion of exploring laughing a lot or learning a lot or really what life is all about. So it would seem like kids have the right idea after all. By this definition, acting childish or stop acting childish, it's a natural state of humans actually. What's about the notion of being realistic? What does that really mean? Realistic according to whom? Well, how specifically should I be realistic? The phrase is ludicrous, and calling people dreamers or telling them to get your head out of the clouds does not help them. It only instills limits in them and helps to bring them back into the blind of what is socially acceptable. School. 
School has a huge influence over children. They are mandated to go, teachers are powerfully authoritative figures, the peer pressure is extremely high, with all taught to fit in, everyone wants to fit in, so how does the school create a lack of confidence? One factor is peer pressure. Some kids make fun of anyone who does anything differently. School can also divide kids into different learning tracks, which is also unfortunate. Kids can be quite intelligent, much smarter than typically given them credit for. They understand the labels that go with different learning tracks, and they integrate, they integrate these into their identities. The students label slow integrated this as a belief, I, I stink at math, and as they believe helps shape their reality and their whole way of being. A research study shows in the 1960s showed that powerfully expectation influences and performances showed that powerfully expectation influence influences performance. One teacher was told her class students was exceptional, but in the reality is they were standard cross the section students with exceptional class performed exceptional that year. And the teacher commented on how eager the students wanted to learn and how much they enjoyed teaching, how much she enjoyed, enjoyed teaching them. The next year, another normal cross section students in her class. At the time, the experiments told that her students were poor and poor performers. An exception to the beliefs and create a reality, the poor students performed awfully. And the same teacher who had just had the exceptional students a prior year remarked how awful the students were, how much they hated learning and how much hard it was for them to, for her to teach now we could take this idea and project only positive expectations onto our children furthermore we can expect excellence from all of these people we interact with you can expect excellence from everybody and it will surprise you to learn how often people will rise up to whatever standards that you set for them mass media a lack of confidence also comes from the media mainstream media funded in advertising ultimately it's out to get people to consume network television programs free because advertisers give them networks large amounts of money in order to introduce their products to the captive audience terrestrial radio is free for the same reason individuality is dangerous to these advertisers because when you think of for yourself you could decide for yourself whether the producer is right the product is right for you or not you won't be buying for the sake of conformity and keeping up with the Joneses it is to the advertisers benefit if you lack confidence they have tactics of telling everyone else that the product is there for for them and it must be as well if it's for everyone else they teach you to feel bad if you don't have their product they teach you that life can become an instant party if you you consume their product my favorite example is that this is a stereotypical beer commercial to watch less than healthy guy watching TV endlessly you see him given a beer and you already know what happens next At least according to the commercial life instantly becomes a party beautiful women swoon over him if he realizes he has his dream sports car he's vacationing on a tropical island he can forget about any of life's ordinary troubles it behooves the media to do this to sell more products hypersensitivity Hypersensitivity, sometimes being oversensitive, can lead to shyness. People can become afraid of doing anything or fear the offending person or getting into trouble. Being sensitive may be useful in some contexts, such as when you really want to emphasize with another person. But if a person is super sensitive all the time, it becomes detri detrimental. I know this because I used to be hypersensitive and I never spoke or never stepped outside of the comfort zone. I never did anything that might have the remotest possibility of aggravating people. This occurred in a result of my incon incapacitated fear. I figured that since I was so sensitive, others must be the same way. Therefore, I decided to stop. I decided it was necessary to tiptoe around people so as to manage their feelings. Only later did I discover the nonsense this turned out to be. It's important to be sensitive to one point, but at the same time, you need to have confidence to do what it takes to achieve your goals. People are remarkably resilient. And if you have the confidence accidentally hurt someone's feelings, there's a very simple remedy. Your apology. You apologize, resolve not to do it again, and move on. It's really that simple. The myth of shy gene. Some people leave themselves as, I'm just have the shy gene. It brings me to the myth of genetic shyness. Many people simply accept the shyness as rationalizing it by saying, well, that's just the way I am. Or what a loaded phrase. Step back again. That's just the way I am. Well, that's just me. That's who I am. What a loaded phrase. These people need to stop saying that as if they are chanting negativity reinforcing mantra. The real secret is broken affirmations that keeps people stuck. The affirmation, the affirmation every day and in every way I'm getting better and better. What about that affirmation? Every day and in every way I'm getting better and better it's famous affirmation by Emil Coe it's an early self-help pioneer and I'm shy because that's the way I am that's also an affirmation but it should be appended with the statement according to me 
you can decide that you were born with shyness, sure, but you can also decide that you could break free from it. And the myth that person simply is or is not shy is one of the worst myths ever passed from a disempowered people to the other disempowered people. Believing that your parents were shy and that's what caused you to be shy is no excuse. The same goes for kids. People do not become shy automatically. They are born. There's no shyness gene. People become what they've learned to behave and act like in a certain way. When I was shy around people, it was because I was in a habit of looking looking at a person and thinking he or she won't like me. This was always left in my mind. I was feeling bad inside, picturing the person rejecting me and feeling immense and paralyzing fears. Well, that was simply the way I've learned to behave. I only knew one way of behaving, but fortunately, I found more choices. Your parents may or may not have influenced you to be shy, but that's different from the inflicting that you is some untreatable genetic disease, which is really what this means when people say, that's just the way I am. The truth about shyness is, let me tell you the truth in the myth of, I'm shy. It's an excuse that enables people to stay stuck. It is not straight. Shy is not straight. It's the only way of acting. And if you cannot act one way, and if you can act one way, that means you can act another way too. Shy is a behavioral mode. It's not an objective or it describes a person. It's actually a behavioral mode. And it's not a state of being. It's a way of acting. And if you can behave in a confident manner too, then you can behave in a confident manner too. You always have the choice. People locked into that I'm shy excuses. They don't, they don't realize that they have a choice. Consider this. If you could choose your identity, if you could choose the way you see yourself, would you deliberately label yourself as shy, as a person lacking confidence, as hesitant in anything less than glorious? Absolutely not. And yet, that's unfortunately what so many people do when they say, I'm shy, or I'm just not confident, or anything else of that nature. Therefore, it's important to avoid the phrase, I'm shy. Worse than saying, I'm shy, though it's talking about shyness as if some sort of disease or disorder. Yeah, he has a case of shyness. He has a shyness disorder. Well, that's the most ridiculous thing ever. If you walk into a room and shy, I walk into a room of shy people and bug that's flying around bites me. I do become shy too. No, that's a downright absurd. People don't go walking around one day and go, ah, oh, they crumple up to the ground and then get di diagnosed with shyness. The fear, fear, and F E A R, fear. Have you ever watched kids play? They really don't know to dig in and thoroughly enjoy themselves. They really know how to dig in and thoroughly enjoy themselves. When they're having a good time, kids totally embrace whatever they are doing in the moment with joyful abandon. Kids are true dreamers. Children, in essence, have not been trained yet to their own limitations the way adults have. In fact, children enter the world with no only two natural fears, the fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. Aside from these, all other fears are learned. Human beings are magnificent learnings, are magnificent at learning. Because they have learned from fear things, aside from the only two natural fears, you can naturally empower yourself to the most past, to move past your fear by learning new ways of behaving. A study is conducted among adults to research their greatest fears and the fear of public speaking rated highest other than any other fear or of death. This is irrational. Being more afraid of public speaking than of death is a direct result of learning to fear something that does not need to be feared. Fear can be characterized in an acronym. Fear, meaning false evidence appearing real. False evidence appearing real. Fear. When people realize that public speaking is simply a process, not a life or death event, the false evidence disappears with it and goes the fear. With the fear gone, people can be in their more natural, confident selves. Confidence is an is our natural state of being. It's a state of confidence. Should we be natural in a state of being? The fact is that we were born and simply not self-conscious. It's not like we popped out of the womb and say, oh, I'm naked. Could somebody please give me some clothes here? Oh, I'm shy now. Oh no, everybody, look at me, I'm naked. Children are already in their natural state of being, absolutely confident, full of wonder, ready to explore the world around them. What if we were to adopt that same childlike attitude? for going after what we wanted to in the world. When you were first born, did you immediately stand up and start walking around, though it were not completely normal to you? Obviously you did not. Well, neither did I, and neither did anyone else. And learning how to walk, children take that attitude. Hey, I'm gonna go do some walk, I'm gonna do that walking thing. And I see others around me doing it, so I know I could do it too. I'm going to persevere. I'm going to persevere. It didn't matter how many times I fall down. It didn't matter how many times I got up. All that mattered is, it only mattered that I just kept getting up. And if you get the chances, watch kids as they begin to walk. They crawl around, stand up, wobble, wobble, fall down, then they do it again, over and over again. Kids continue doing this until they learn how to consistently walk. Nothing will stop them from learning how to walk. When you have the same attitude and going after your goals, nothing will stop you from achieving them. What if kids infected you with the same useless attitudes of some adults have? What if kids were infected with the same useless attitudes? 
foods. If we were, if we try something, it doesn't work, we just give up. We'd all have people who refused to walk just because they didn't get up perfectly when they were kids. They tried it once and they didn't even work or try it again, so they gave up and decided they weren't going to be walkers. Can you picture a little baby with his arms crossed, pouting, scowling intensely just because he took the lackadaisical adult attitude if something didn't immediately work and he just gave up? Can you imagine a little baby saying in a snooter manner, walking isn't for me, I do other things. I tried it once and it really was not cut out from it for me. I wasn't... Walking isn't for me. Kids kept going on until they mastered their skills. That's what they do. We as adults need to learn from them and keep that same attitude that kids have towards learning and walking. Chapter 3. What is confidence? All our dreams can come true if we have the courage to pursue them. Walt Disney. In order to understand what confidence is, it is necessary to define both what it is and what it is not. Once we are on the same page as what is confidence is and isn't, we can move forward towards gaining unstoppable confidence. What confidence is not. Confidence means different things to so many different people. Similarly, confidence also evokes certain feelings and automatic reactions within people. Before you go any further in shedding light on what confidence is, we'll discover what is absolutely not. Arrogance versus confidence. Arrogance versus confidence. Sometimes arrogance is mistaken for confidence. They're not the same things, folks. Arrogance is either a honed reaction or an effect or an infectation. Whatever it is, it's definitely not something completely different. It's something completely different from confidence. Arrogance learns towards elitism, being macho, showing off, and so on. Have you ever seen those really huge guys with bulging muscles, the ones who are overdeveloped in the to the point that they find it necessarily to thrust their chest out and swagger in the most cocky way. This is an example of arrogance, but not true confidence. It is from what they consider themselves better than everyone else solely because they're so large. True confidence comes from within, and when you realize you are confident, you do not feel the need to proclaim it to the world. Now contrast the example of arrogance with the following example of true confidence. Stop for a moment and consider the famous muscular movie star Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone. These guys did not go around with puffed up chest thinking they're better than everyone else. Instead, they had a quiet but powerful confidence that comes from acute awareness of their abilities. This is a major difference and we'll explore this further later in the book. But it is never necessary to shout out from the mountaintops in order to convey that you are a confident individual. These people who are who do so are hardly even confident. They're more like trying to appear. And I have met many people who are confident and many people who have lacked confidence. The truly confident people have a similar trait. It's that their confidence came from within and it did not have to be voiced. A nonchalant, matter-of-fact confidence is ideal. It's just a nonchalant, matter-of-fact confidence. Now, there's no need to brag about one's accomplishments. Those who brag are the only ones making their insecurities about themselves. Allow your results to speak for themselves. Action speaks louder than words. So, take your confidence and make it happen. If someone has to continually broadcast his or her confidence, it really makes me wonder. It seems that this person is not really confident at all. Instead, this person is often trying to convince himself or herself by proclaiming it to the others. In his or her own mind, this helps it more official. Makes it more official in their mind. But... The person trying to gain confidence in an ineffective manner. Confidence comes from within. And when you believe in yourself, others will believe in it too. This is a universal law and a secret known to all leaders. It does not work another way around. No matter how much you would prefer it to. There are far easier and more effective ways to skyrocket your confidence than waiting for others to believe in you. You will learn them later on in this book as well. Now you have belligerence versus confidence. Now let's talk about the difference between belligerence and confidence. Using relationships as an example, sometimes women are apparently attracted to jerks. And I'm not sure many of us have seen the examples in our lives or perhaps what someone has currently done in this situation on the surface. The jerk, the jerk exhibits some bad boy traits that some women may perceive as confidence. The jerk is probably convincing himself that he has it all going on. What masquerades and confidence of the jerk is belligerence. This presents oneself in a form of super aggressive attitude. You can and should always assert yourself whenever you deem it necessary. However, this does not mean bullying people, treating them badly, or trampling all over them. Belligerence is what makes a jerk just that. The jerk is abrasive and cares little for the relationship he forms with others. Instead, he chooses to bulldoze his way through life. True confidence, however, allows to go through life easily, effectively, getting results that you want, to make people feel good when they have dealt with you. People making people feel good even if it's for no reason other than just because you can. The true confidence comes from within. Now take a moment and think. 
of an area of your life where you may be confident and ask yourself this question how do you know that you are pro proficient in that area name that area again how do you know that you are proficient in songwriting proficient in breakdancing proficient in music how do you know that you're proficient in dancing period and being completely honest with yourself supply an answer and if you absolutely know that you are proficient in the area you choose because your own thoughts are filling a belief system that you told so congratulations you are really confident in that area now if you were not sure about the proficiency in your area or that you had to rely on external uh, confirmation from your peers, spouse, supervisor, you are not quite yet as confident as you can be. Well, by the end of this book, after doing the exercises, you'll be right there. When you have done all the exercises completed in this book, you will have the true confidence that comes from within. Confidence, or lack of thereof, is a reality across all demographics, across all races, all economic levels, all allegations. There's always some people who are confident and some people who are not. Even a rich and famous movie star who many people envy and consider to have it all gets nervous at times because he or she wants to perform well. Competence versus confidence. Are confident and competence the same thing? No, in fact. They are quite distinct in understanding the difference is essential. Competence is defined as the ability to do something and confidence defined as your belief about your competence. Each of us has an individuality, experience, beliefs, and values that make us perceive life in our own individual way. Everyone has his or her own perception of reality, a unique model of the world. This means that it's only in a perception, not in reality. The empowering part of this idea is that those beliefs can be changed in and those be changed and in turn change one's perception of life this means that the exercises and strategies described in this book will change your beliefs and your perception of what is possible for yourself confidence without competence confidence without competence well it is absolutely a recipe for disaster to lack competence yet possess the project unjustified confidence take for example someone who has never flown a plane before has ridden on a plane and thinks he and she are now is an ace pilot since he has read a book on a about a decade ago would you let that person fly you across the country i would get off that plane as fast as people would think as it was as, as i was a blur you can easily see how there was numerous examples of confidence without competence and why it's dangerous competence without confidence competence without confidence people are competent and yet lacking the confident are stuck in a quagmire they might have been perfect understanding in some powerful concepts without even taking action someone who has the knowledge and the competence to do something and does not nothing and does nothing instead is no better off than someone who is clueless and incompetent again someone who has the knowledge and the competence to do something and does nothing instead is no better off than someone who is clueless and incompetent now when i was getting started in my own real estate investment i was a classic example of competence without confidence i studied and studied and studied real estate and i read ten books took three home study courses attended a seminar signed up for two mentoring programs and still i was stuck big time in his quagmire that I wasn't even aware of or could get caught in I saw others being successful and knew exactly how they were doing it and how they were and knew how they were doing it but when I was when I asked them about it they confirmed to me that they were just doing exactly what I was only thinking about now what was holding me back was it my lack of confidence my fear of the unknown I wouldn't have known absolutely everything about all the real estate before taking any action at all so I kept studying and studying trying in vain to learn everything so I could actually get started meanwhile the people around me had their businesses taking off because they were taking action the four levels of competence there are four levels of competence that people go through and develop to skills those four levels are unconscious incompetence conscience conscious incompetence conscious competence and unconscious competence you will never throw you you will travel through these stages as you reach unstoppable confidence the four levels of competence competence is knowing something the four levels are unconscious compet unconscious incompetence conscious incompetence you have conscience competence and unconscious competence unconscious incompetence unconscious incompetence means you do not possess a skill nor even the awareness of how to use that skill could be someone who's extremely shy and does not even recognize how beneficial learning how to make more conf how to be more confident would 
B for him or her could be considered unconsciously incompetent in that area of confidence. I spent the first 20 years of my life like this, being shy and knew no other way of being, nor I was cognizant of the fact that other people didn't have to live trapped in my shells. By reading this book, you have already passed through the stage of unconscious incompetence. Picking up this book means you are already looking for a better way to live, which means you are at least at the stage, next stage of perhaps further on your unstoppable confidence journey. Unstoppable confidence. Unstoppable confidence. Conscious incompetence. Conscious incompetence. When I was in college, I finally looked around and realized just how shy I was and other people were actually confident. I had moved to the second level of skill development, which is the conscious incompetence. And I became aware of just how shy I was. And when we become aware of something lacking in our lives, it is a great opportunity because that means we can take a chance to improve our lives. When I became conscious of my incompetence, I began reading numerous self-help books and doing exercises, attended seminars, watched videos, basically tried anything to further my confidence. And the more I worked on myself the same way as you were doing now by reading this book, the further I moved towards conscious competence. Conscious competence is a state of being in which you can apply a skill, yet you have to consciously think about applying the skill, and the skill is not yet a habit for you. The vast majority of you at this point in the book are probably consciously, unstoppably confident. Now, you know how to be confident, and that's a matter of developing this into a habit. Now, give yourself the gift of your own 21-day unstoppable confidence challenge. Deliberately... Practice your confidence for 21 days consecutively until you reach the skill level of unconsciously competence. Unconscious competence. Unconscious competence is the fourth level of skill development called unconscious competence. Unconscious competence. This is the ultimate stage of any skill. Unconscious competence is the state from which the skill has been ungrained as a habit. You don't have to spend your time thinking about applying the skill. People who are masters of what they do in the function and the level of consciously competence, of unconscious competence, if someone were to injure, if were to inquire about how specifically they perform at such high levels, they may not be able to verbally describe what they do. The reason for this is that they are no longer conscious of what they do in order to perform at such great feats. Competence plus confidence equals success. Now, competence plus confidence equals success. Being unstoppable means you have both competence and confidence and going for it. This is what this book is all about, having competence and confidence. And when you have the competence to do what you want and the confidence to follow through and take action, you're going to be unstoppable. The Nine Factors of Unstoppable Confidence, Chapter 4. Courage is the first human quality because it's the quality which guarantees all others. Winston Churchill Now that we've defined what confidence is and isn't, let's look at nine factors that stand between you and unstoppable confidence. You must learn to memorize all of them if you wish to master this program and make your dreams come true. The nine factors are as followed. Experience Perception Decisiveness Empowerment Goals Action motivation, momentum, and commitment. Factor one, experience. There are certain beliefs that are more empowering than others when you are doing something for the first time. How you perform the first time you take on a new challenge will affect you on how you perform when faced with it again later. Believing the following affirmations will enable you to achieve greater results more quickly. There's a first time for everything, so when doing something for the first time, remember this. The first time I do it, I do this, the first time I do this is the hardest. Each and every time I do this, it does get easier. And when I succeed, it will study my actions so I can improve even more. And if I don't get the right outcome, I'll learn from my mistakes and do things differently next time. And it does get easier. That's all you have to remember about doing anything for the first time. Keep these affirmations in mind as you overcome difficult tasks and tackle adversity in the forms of something that you have not done before. The Confidence Success Cycle. In this book, I've given you many generalizations about confidence, and it's important through to define what confidence means to you specifically. Now, what do you expect to see, hear, feel when you experience confidence? The reason it's important to know is that so when you achieve the level of confidence you desire, you'll know when you've arrived. 
With ultimate confidence in yourself, and other people will believe in you too, also your belief in yourself will increase exponentially as others come to count on you. You will also have confidence to risk stepping outside of your comfort zone, and you will also find yourself achieving things that were previously impossible. This in turn will give you more confidence, and others will believe in you even further. This concept is the first basis for the confidence success cycle. Your confidence success increases syn cyclically as you continue to push the limits and achieve like you've never had before. Factor 2. Perception. In the course of this book, I've introduced a lot of concepts, some from which you'll probably accept it straight away, and others from which you have doubts and had to think about more. Well, I'll continue to give you new concepts and ideas that may challenge you the old ways of thinking. For instance, you may not believe this next concept as a key concept of neurolinguistical programming. Neurolinguistic programming, NLP, described as more detailed in the introduction at first, but as you think about it carefully, you'll realize how pervasively it applies to your life already. Are you ready? What does it mean? Meaning does not exist as a concrete reality. It is purely a subjective phenomenon of perception. What does it mean? How do you think about something is entirely up to you? You could put a positive or negative frame around whatever experience you have in life. Since you have always the choice to either laugh or cry based on the experience, do whichever you prefer, and I prefer laughing. So I find myself doing that more often. A friend of mine told me this story, and he was sitting on a bench out in a park right next to a rather large crack in the sidewalk, and a man came by, tripped on the crack, fell on his face, and the first into the bushes next to the and fell face first into the bushes next to the sidewalk. Dusting himself off, he quickly got up, glanced around to see if anyone was watching, and unfortunately for him, my friend was watching the entire episode. Noticing this, the man turned several shades and read before hurrying away and fast as he could. Later that same night, a woman came walking across the same path in the same place in the sidewalk. She tripped, fell flat on her back, spontaneously reacted to let loose with a fully belly laugh. She laughed so hard she began crying. She acted as if she slipped was the funniest experience she's ever had, and it seemed she could not stop herself from laughing. By the time her laughter had died down, my friend was staring at her nonchalantly. She picked herself up, smiled, and acknowledged my friend, and happily darted off into the night. The meaning of any experience, event, or interaction varies widely upon two people, because their choices as to from which the ways of they make it. If someone offers you an insult, remember that it's only the person's opinion. By adopting that useful belief, you can move thoroughly and through the world more prepared to deal with anything that life throws at you. Contrast this with any way of some people take insults personally and waste your valuable time and energy being bothered by them. You are a meaning maker. You are a meaning maker. And if you have to perceive some comment to be derogatory, stop yourself and give it more positive spins. Do this because you can. Now remember, nobody else has the power to determine your own perception of events, only you. So, in my own life, I had a business project and it went sour and for a while I spent some time being bitter and frustrated and stuck in my victim mentality. Finally, I started to ask myself a question like, well, what can I learn from this experience and what does the outcome of this project really mean? And when I asked myself these questions, I immediately recognized that I could shift into a more useful mentality. And what had been a sore point in my sore point for me became an opportunity to look at the adversity as a challenge. And it now is up to me to rise above and conquer and over the difficult situation in order to achieve the right outcome. It is exactly what happened. Had I latched onto the victim mentality and refused to let go, I would have never completed my own business project. And any time you choose, you could change your perception and create a new meaning for something. Factor 3. Decisiveness. It is easy to identify people who have unstoppable confidence just by watching the way they make a decision. The deciding factor. Confident people make decisions rapidly and with a sense of finality. Once a decision is made, they are committed to it, and that's rarely, and they rarely change their minds. Confident people never waver because they know what they want. As we saw earlier in the book, it is imperative to know what you have wanted beforehand. That way, when either an opportunity or a problem presents itself, you can think hard and ask yourself, hey, is this congruent with what I want? Does this coincide with my personal policies and my integrity? Asking yourself these questions allow you to size up the decision that you are making so that you can come back with a decisive and confident answer. Steps of Confidence Decision Making Steps of confident decision making prior to undertaking anything. There are some things that you have known about yourself. This may sound simple enough, but it is sometimes very different to know what is in your heart. What is it that you want? What is your ultimate goal? 
What are your personal policies that influence your integrity? And who are you? What is it that you stand for? What is what are the acceptable and unacceptable outcomes for your goal? Asking yourself these questions with face of any kind of decision will help you make a confident decision. And it will help you with your confident decision making. Before anything else, you need to take an inventory of yourself. Get to know yourself, who you are and what you stand for. Where you are going with your life and how you are going to get there. And what you know about the answers. Everything else becomes very simple. Now, if a question of a problem of an opportunity arises, you need to size up your situation from all angles and order a competent and be a confident decision maker. Look at it in front of your position. Look at it in front of the other side and look at how your position will affect you over time. If you were to say yes to this decision and move forward with it, how would it impact your life? Imagine yourself a few months down the road after having a yes in the decision. Imagine one five years. Imagine in five years, how is your life? Again, if you were to say yes to this decision and move forward with it, how would it impact your life? Imagine yourself a few months down the road after having said yes to this decision. Imagine one year, five years. Now how's your life? Think about how the future might be if you said no. What might your life be like then? What might it be like in a few weeks, months, few years? Once you have seen the picture clearly in your mind, decide that it's congruent with your goals or not, and let your goals be your road map always. Let your goals be your road map. Trust your internal voice. Another difference between people who are unstoppable with confidence and those who do not, who, who do not, is that people with unstoppable confidence trust in their internal voices. Although they listen to others too for feedback, they tend to really more place more of their weight on their own internal voice than the voices of those around them. People who lack unstoppable confidence tends to listen to the voices around them far too much. This leads to propensity and conformist thinking because people listening to the following of everyone else's will naturally become like everyone else. People who are unstoppable have to rely on their own internal voice. Otherwise, they would allow everything else to be stinking thinking. Else would be stinking thinking to, con to convince them that whatever goals they are seeking to accomplish cannot be achieved. Listening to your internal voice means that you recognize what is valid. Useful feedback is what is negative, destructive criticism. People who listen to your internal voice are said to have internal frame of reference. People who follow your voices of others are said to have external frame of reference. Internal and external frames of reference. The way to discover your personal style is in this manner. Is if you haven't already, ask yourself the following questions. If nobody told you, would you know what to do? How would you do what you've done how do you know you've done a great job? Does someone else need to give you answers? Who decides if you're getting the best use out of your time? As you answer each of these questions honestly, you might notice a pattern emerging. If you answer and based off the other's feedback, right now you have an external frame of reference. Now if you answer based off your internal voice, then your, your gut feeling, you'll have an internal frame of reference. Factor 4. Empowerment. When you are unstoppably confident, there is a powerful difference between you and the normal population. The difference is control. You have more control over the environment, over the emotional state, over your beliefs, ultimately over your actions. That is the simple difference between people who are empowered and people who are not. People who are not empowered have excuses. Control. People who are not empowered have all the reasons why it is impossible to be, to do, or to have something. Those who are unstoppable realize that everything that you want to do is under their own control. They are the masters of their own universe, and they don't know how to do something. If they don't know how to do something, they realize that there's some other resource that will teach them how to do it. And I think, and I like to think of myself as a reverse paranoid. A reverse paranoid is a person who thinks that the universe is perfect and that everything on the planet wants to help him or her achieve his or her dreams. I'm a reverse paranoid. That means that I believe that the universe is actually perfect and that everybody on the planet actually wants to help me achieve my goals and dreams. By the law of reciprocity, in order to fulfill my dreams, I'm going to help others make their dreams come true. The universe works for such rewards for those who serve others. The greater of the energy is that you put forth coupled with the service you provide to others. The better the result you will enjoy when you ask yourself, How can I be of service to others today? How can I be of service to others today? How can I serve this person I'm talking to today? Always contemplate that. When you ask yourself that, you will experience a paradigm shift of great proportions. Greater empowerment equals more choices. Empowered people simply have more choices than dis dispowered people. 
People who do not allow themselves to find other choices available to them are likely to become disempowered. Although, always contemplate the number of choices that you have in any given situation and do your best to generate more options. Perhaps there's an option that you have thought of that you would like to have uh, as ideal. All you need to do now is empower yourself to think of the solution and then act on it. With greater empowerment comes truer sense of freedom because you have the liberty to choose from more options. Adding more options to your life. There's an easy way to add more options to your life. Pay attention to people who use language. Language indicates how they view the world. It can easily empower us to limit us through what we say. Some people use their language to try to force limitations on you. Anytime someone offers you two choices, beware. Ask yourself if there are any choices that have not been mentioned. Is there anything stopping you from choosing your options? The more options you make, the more empowered you are, which means you will have a greater chance of success. Salespeople are taught to intentionally use their langu language to limit our apparent choices. For example, let's suppose you found a certain model of automobile that you like and the salesperson might say something like in the effect of, well now that you've decided on this car, would you like to pay for this in cash or do you want to finance it through us? The question automatically assumes that you're going to purchase the car and with the only remaining detail being now specifically of what you want or how you want to pay for it. Even if you did want to purchase the car, there may not be another... There might be another payment option that the salesperson's limiting statement has cover hasn't covered. What if there was a hybrid part cash, part financing option? That is not reflecting in the salesperson's statement, is it? Well, here's some questions to generate more options when you're presented with only a few options. Well, what's stopping us from doing both or all? Or are the is that all the options only? Or what other options haven't we examined yet? What other options haven't we examined yet? Are these our only options? Disempowered people simply find themselves to lacking choices, which thus compelled to enact upon their addictions, not only of choice, but of our sheer necessity. Even if we were to consider psychopathic criminals, they appear as if they are forced to perform these evil deeds. In interviews, they often reveal how they went to great lengths to cover them up, as they did because they internally understood that it was wrong. Inevitably, the question gets posed to them of why they perpetrated the violent acts. As if they could truly understand the acts were immortal and wrong, they acknowledged that while they knew it was wrong, they felt as if they had no other options and their criminal acts were their only choice. Again, this is simply their perception of reality. I'm not condoning or apologizing for criminal behavior, but rather painting out or pointing out the fact that these people need to make better choices for themselves and do not need to first, first need to become aware of those choices and realize their validity. The initial step to becoming more empowered is to eliminate the belief that you have few choices and replace the belief to the knowledge that you have many choices. You always have the freedom to choose, no matter what the situation, even in the times from which you apparently lack a choice. There really is a solution. There really is always a solution when you keep this belief as you go through life. You will find that you have an enriched sense of control over your life, which escapes most people. Factor 5 goals. A natural complement to unstoppable confidence is being goal-oriented. Goal orientation and confidence form a combination that will make all of your dreams come true. Goal orientation and some confidence. Some confidence with your goal orientation is the recipe for a combination that will make all your dreams come true. Some set goals. Have you the foresight to know what you want in your life, to set up some long-term goals, and when, you're off, and when they're fully realized, you will find yourself living your dream with your long-term vision defined? Plan out your own medium-range goals. These are the goals from which between your immediate time and short-term ones, your long-term vision. Now, when you accomplish your medium-term goals, you will find that you are right on track to achieving everything else that you want. Break down all your medium goals into a smaller, smaller immediate goal with your accompanying of a next year by the next year. Then continue breaking down the goals until you have monthly and then weekly ones. Finally, you will have specific actions to undertake each and every day in order to move the ultimately towards your dreams of life. Set an outcome for everything you do in life with your purpose. You will be glad that you did. As a way a climber reaches the summit of a mountain is to continue putting on a foot after another foot towards the top. It is the same way from which one, one runs a marathon, one step at a time. What is essential is always keeping going. Never quit. Do it now. Keep it going. Never quit. Do it now. At Harvard studies on, a goal, on goal setting that took place in the 1950s, in a Harvard study, there was a following study in the 1950s, and it followed up in the 1980s. The study is that in the 1950s showed that 3% of the respondents had set goals at the time of their graduation. By the 1980s hit, this 3% was financially worth more than the remaining 97% combined. 
Again, by the 1980s, the 3% was finance, financially worth more than the remaining 97% combined. Now, these people had focus and direction, and these were displayed by setting their goals. They gained a maximum benefit from this book. You've got to set goals. We will begin this journey when we're taking together by setting goals and your own personal growths. Now, outcomes versus goals. Outcomes and goals are similar in scope, but they have subtle differences. Goals typically have weightier stakes attached, whereas an outcome is a mini goal. An outcome is a mini goal from which you desire from a particular situation. A goal is a dream with a deadline. When you hang out with your friends and the outcome is simply to have a good time, you don't have a goal when you're hanging out with them. The most recent goal in life is to sell a certain number of copies of this book within the next year. The magnitude of this goal, of this outcome, differ. Though outcomes are much smaller in scope, they are still very useful. By identifying what you want out of any activity or interaction, you will much more likely be to obtain it. Now, if you didn't know what I wanted out of this interaction or activity, you would, I know, how would you know how to proceed? I wouldn't. Well, after you decide on your outcome or goal, figure out what it's going to take to accomplish it. Now, what kind of person will you have to be in order to make these dreams come true? Again, when you've got your goal in front of you, you have to figure out what it's going to take to accomplish this. this. And what kind of person do you need to be in order to make it come true? And once you know, commit to becoming that kind of person. Smart questions for making smart goals. Smart questions for making smart goals. Stop for a moment and answer these questions. Smart questions. S period M-A-R-T. S-M-A-R-T. Goals. What do you want to get out of this book? What's stopping you from getting this right now? What's important to you about achieving your goals? What will it be like for you to have accomplished the unstoppable confidence? What will having unstoppable confidence do for you? Are you ready to eliminate all your fear, uncertainty, and hesitation and doubt forever? How will you know when you have unstoppable confidence? Well, after answering these questions, you are now ready to set a SMART Goal for yourself. The acronym SMART stand for SMART. Uh, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, timed. Specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, timed. SMART. Specific makes your outcome specific when you state when you will see, hear, feel, and experience it. This will help you provide points from you can check to verify if you have undoubtedly achieved your desired outcome. I general and a general outcome may be, well, I want to get confidence out of this book. And that does not work as well as following up specific outcomes. I want to gain two specific strategies from eliminating my fear of changing jobs and gain confidence in knowing I will succeed at whatever I have a job. I succeed at whatever job that I have. Measurable. Measurable. Your outcome is measurable when you have a clear way and know whether you have met it or not. An immeasurable outcome is, I will become confident by the end of this book. I'm using the techniques described in its pages. While confidence is sometimes difficult to measure, you can get creative and find ways to do just that. A more measurable outcome is, I will make direct eye contact with people in my new job. I will maintain confident physiology, posture, and bearing. And I will be more outgoing by initiating conversations with my coworkers. Achievable. Achievable ensures that your outcome is achievable. What is physically viable for you to accomplish? Ensure that you have a good likelihood of success. Remember that while you are unstoppable, you can achieve anything you desire, but you must simultaneously plan a smooth progression. Driving a movement from point A to point B that stretches your comfort zone as you march towards success. Avoid setting yourself up for frustration by setting out outcomes that is unattainable in a realistic time frame plan your progression know the small steps and along the way you will be led to your ultimate goals setting achieving goals achieve them and reset your goals even higher and if you feel like the shyest person in the world right now setting goals to instantly be the life of the party will only set you up for a rude awakening you can and will be the life of the party if you want eventually but first with these early steps like talking to strangers and confidently asking about how are they doing how are you guys doing how are you doing when you start there that's the way it goes realistic 
realistic outcomes are outcomes that are by definition obtainable and if you want to grow wings and fly that is not going to happen asking for an unrealistic outcome is set you up for a failure now when you set realistic outcomes you will be proud of yourself when you achieve them before Neil Armstrong landed on the moon few people in America believed it was even possible however when a team of US scientists knew what knew that it would work in theory to do this to the very end they designed the Apollo missions which went to the moon and the rest is history as long as your outcome has a basis in reality the theoretical feasibility it is realistic timed timed make sure your outcome is timed by attaching specific deadlines to the accomplishment as often as people want their dreams and they are to start a glow with a euphoria they describe them to me as a perfect detail later on in the conversation inevitably ask them I inevitably ask them what their goals are immediate short-term and long terms their goals if any are radically different from and do not bear any resemblance to their dreams their dreams are what they really want those dreams are unlikely to be achieved unless there's a deadline attached along with the workable plan on how to achieve those dreams goals are dreams with deadlines Important goals do nothing for one's motivation. This is why it's so important to have an outcome of a book for a book and a timeline as to when you want to achieve your specific measurable results. Goals are dreams with deadlines. Impotent goals do nothing for one's motivation. That is why it's so important to have an outcome for this book and timeline as when you want to achieve your specific measurable results. A good example is by the time I finish this book, after I gain unstoppable confidence, I'll be able to walk up to any stranger, stranger and introduce myself. Another good way is I will feel calm and relaxed when talking to strangers in social situations. Setting a goal contract along with other goals that you are setting I want you to specifically set a goal for your confidence I want you to set a specific measurable achievable goal for your confidence and I want you to see through it to the finish I've used this concept in the part of my goals all the areas of my life and I've always find it to be amazingly effective write out your goals using the smart criteria that we have discussed specific measurable achievable realistic and timed and at the bottom of the pages, make a space for your signature and your name on the date. And at the top of the sheet, give it a title, Goal Contract. And in legal definition of the contract, it is a meeting of the minds that you will write out the contract and sign it. Now think of it as a meeting of your own consciousness and your own unconsciousness minds. This begins legally binding a document, a legal contract, from which you must execute because of its binding power. Whether it's asking someone out for a date or demanding to raise from your boss demanding a raise from your boss I want you to make it a goal to assert yourself confidently in at least one area of your life by a certain date near the future now remember you're under contract now factor six action two young women both attended the same graduation class college 15 years ago Samantha became a lawyer and Kathy became an engineer in a high technology field they are both proud parents successful careers faithful marriages they own their own homes and by all appearances seem to be leading happy lives the only thing missing is a sense of fulfillment in their careers. While they're both technically successful in their careers, they equally disenchanted with him. Samantha does not find what she is doing fulfilling, and neither does Kathy. They used eagerly look forward to work they do not eagerly look forward to work every day. Fifteen years later, however, something inside of them has changed and they no longer find their careers rewarding. They both would rather pursue their true passions. Samantha has always loved baking and wants to open up her own bakery and she learned how to bake as a child and has always enjoyed it Samantha knows that she could do her own bakery and it could be a smashing success she's envisioned it and people coming up from miles around to purchase her baked goods Kathy has always loved music she grew up listening to music every spare moment she could she was singing in her church choir she currently sings in a woman's group yet she visualizes she visualizes what it would be like for her to be a pop singer with her own CD performing for vast audiences across the country fast forward five years Samantha while still yearning for her bakery she's taken no action to actually make her dreams come true and during the day she passes she feels like she's wasting time in her life in her job in someone else's dream instead of jumping out of the bed morning she has a nag herself internally until she rolls out of bed and heads into work and she yearns for Fridays absolutely despises Mondays spending the majority of her time waking hours doing something that she finds despicable she finds as if that she's wasting her life Kathy has taken tremendous action in her past five years and consequently has an album out tours the region has the kind of fan responses create sold-out shows the ideal lifestyle that she dreamt of five years ago has manifested itself through her efforts she cherished each and every moment of her life 
Her time was been spent on stage singing the time she feels her most alive. She doesn't just exist. She knows she's living well. It seems as if her life is better and getting better every single day. Sure, she has her struggles launching her own new CD and getting her name out to be recognized. She has countless people to tell her so. In fact, of defeat, she persisted too. She never quit. She would have been easier to stay in her old job, and yet it would have been tremendously unfulfilling. Kathy paid the price through her commitment to live her dreams. She ultimately made her dream come true. Samantha and Kathy both had dreams and visions for their respective futures. Kathy took action and fulfilled her dreams. Samantha did not. The difference between the two is that Kathy had the confidence to put her plan into motion and take action. Samantha lacked the confidence, but the techniques Kathy practiced, combined with attitudes and beliefs she and other successful people hold while they pursue their dreams. She can, these can be learned and put into use. Most successful people may not consciously be aware of these techniques, but it is a subliminally applied techniques like these that can help you and like them achieve their intended results. Put in, now put it into action. Put it into action. Confidence comes by finding out what specifically you want and making a plan to get it and putting your plan into action. If you're doing well, ask yourself, how is it that you're doing so well? And consequently, you will know how to apply yourself and do it even better. And if you haven't been getting the results that you want, evaluate what you're doing wrong. Adjust your behavior accordingly and do things differently. As much as I'd like to say that all you have to do is incorporate these mental techniques into your life and get confidence, the truth is that unstoppable confidence comes from doing. Unstoppable confidence comes from doing. These mental techniques will help you out. Guaranteed, the most confident people out there are confident because they have proven to themselves over and over again that they have reasons to be confident because they have succeeded it so many times. They pe there are people with the deepest parts of their minds, bodies, and souls that they are capable of being doers. The process of gaining confidence requires action. The goal, the goal contract that you set is the preceding sections that's going to fulfill itself. You will need to do something. Only taking action can give you the undisputed real confidence that you desire and deserve. Factor 7. Motivation. Motivation, another key to being such a go-getter and how you motivate yourself. Do you motivate yourself with pleasure or with pain? Do you think about all the excellence of your life? Think about all the excellence or all the trouble that you want to avoid. You motivate yourself in one of those ways. And the only way from which one you know. Now, only you know which one. Are you moving towards the goals or are you moving away from problems? Methods of motivation. Don't move away from problems. Move towards goals. Methods of motivation, both strategies can be effective in certain contexts. For example, trial lawyers often at the point often use pain avoidance strategies in order to construct strong cases for their clients. They seek minimizing to minimize damages from the opposing attorneys might do to inflict by creating a strong counter arguments. Again, for example, trial lawyers often use a pain avoidance strategy, pain avoidance strategy, which is in order to construct strong cases for their clients. They seek to minimize any damages that our opposing attorney might try to inflict by creating a strong counter argument. The strategy of being pleasure motivated can be equally effective. In fact, a majority of the most successful people who have close family relationships, massive financial success, and career satisfaction have motivational strategies drawing on their own pleasure principle. You may have already realized which motivation style you predominantly utilize. It's having unstoppable confidence, and I encourage you to focus mostly on having positive motivation strategies, allowing you to seek better things in your life. The most successful people have the positive motivation, and if we want the same results, then naturally we should follow suit. The value of negative motivation. While having strategy to move towards excellence can be beneficial in certain circumstances, there's times you can also benefit by having a strategy that moves you away from pain. Since we all have to move away from, move towards pleasure and away from pain, we are always motivated by some degree by one or the other, sometimes by both. Because I wanted to get this book done in a timely manner. Not only did I commit myself to moving towards the pleasure of having the book published, but I also instituted monetary fines of myself of not meeting my writing goals. After I began using the pain avoidance, motivational, my efforts skyrocketed and I became tremendously more productive. As you can think about it, I've applied this. You can think to see all the ways from which you can utilize towards pleasure, moving towards pleasure and away from pain, motivation methods in your life. Now, when you set up your away from pain strategy, make your negative incentives something more slightly annoying, but not, as cata not a catastrophe. Just in case some unforeseeable event leaves you unable to achieve your outcome, your strategy ought to be proportionally to a magnitude of goals have you set, magnitude of the goals that you've set. Here's an example. 
If you're on a diet and you have a piece of cake, you obviously wouldn't punish yourself for fasting for the next rest of the week. You'd be ridiculous. You would want your pleasure rewards and pain punishments to be commensurate with your goal. Instead, you eat some chocolate cake while you're on a diet. You might figure out how many calories are ingested and next time you work out, you'll just burn that many extra calories beyond your normal workout. Make it a habit to stay motivated. It's a habit. It's a habit to stay motivated. It's a habit to stay motivated. Remember, people are becoming addicted to various things all over the time. Gambling, drugs, alcohol, a few of the many destructive addictions people have. The secret to aim for our addiction is a positive direction. People who have an unstoppable confidence have a habit because confidence is a positive habit of theirs. Confidence is a positive habit that they got. What makes the difference in our lives is equally of the habits we form. Each of us have habits already. Let's empower ourselves to have only positive, life-affirming habits and addictions. Habits are tremendously powerful. Without, without them, there'd be so many decisions to make every single day, we'd easily go on in, with information overload, as if we weren't almost there already. Habits simplify our lives and making us so we don't always have to think about what we want to do. We just do it. And that's why it's critical to develop good habits. On your goal contract, make it one of your goals to develop a confidence habit. Make it another goal to pay attention as you become more and more confident and evaluate your progress. Keep a confidence journal. I strongly recommend that you keep a confidence journal so that you can just so you can see just how far you've come. By the time you fully are aware of it, you'll have, have unstoppable confidence. You'll review your journal and naturally you'll be amazed to discover how differently you think and feel. By regularly reviewing your journal, you will also be able to immediately correct yourself so that you can have more confidence in the present and stay motivated towards your future goals. In your journal, feel free to jot down notes, specific techniques from things in this book that you will utilize in the next interaction to cause you to be even more confident. Factor 8. Momentum. Momentum is very valuable for increasing the confidence level. Momentum. Momentum. One of the Newton's law of physics is Newton's law of physics states that the object, the ob, the object at rest, tends to stay at rest unless it is acted upon by an outside force. Similarly, the object of motion tends to stay in motion. Applying the same law to confidence about if you are at rest, you may be a bit difficult to begin increasing your confidence. However, after overcoming the initial resistance for the rate from which you gain confidence in yourself will soon accelerate. For people who have unstoppable confidence, it's easy to accelerate the rate from which you gain confidence. Stop for a moment and take a survey of how much momentum that you have in your life. Are you in motion? Are you out there making it happen? Are you going a little slower? Only you can honestly judge this for yourself. And do you need to crank it up a notch? No matter where you are, you can always increase your momentum. The best way to do this is by starting small. As you continue to take small steps each day, you draw closer and closer to your goals. The small things add up, and it's pretty soon you'll be leading your life in the way of your dreams. After you're at the top of your mountain, having fulfilled all your goals, you can look back and you can say, Wow, what you've done and marvel on how all those small actions you took led up to this massive success. These small actions can be any number of things. They can be simple steps to educate yourself on the goals from which you're in your sights, buying books, attending seminars, and so on. The way I become a full-time real life estate investing entrepreneur was by subscribing to the aforementioned strategy. I learned a branch of real estate investing called creative real estate investing and requires neither money nor credit because when I started I had neither and when I did to allow me to go fulfill full time into the business was I had to read a lot of books, attend a few seminars in real estate and made some offers on houses each week and made calls to sellers after every single day and work every day. Every day you are either moving towards your goals or you moving away from them. Personally, I would like to always be moving towards my goals. Momentum is infinitely powerful and you can make it work for you or against you. So make it work for you. Factor 9. Commitment. Commitment. When people commit themselves to their destiny, they go for it. Full tilt. Consequently, to achieve their goals, master motivational speaker Anthony Robbins says, Success is currently in... Success is cutting off all of your options for failure. And as you realize what you're specifically wanting out of your life and decide that you're willing to pay that price to achieve it, you must be willing to commit yourself and cut off all options that lead to anything less than achieving your goal. Commitment is very powerful in fulfilling your dreams. Many people say, don't burn your bridges. It's just the opposite. I say, learn to burn and burn very well. Find out what you want to do. Commit yourself 100% and then burn away any options for failures. And ask yourself about all the excuses that might prevent you from accomplishing the goal. And after you do that, go through the torch of each bridge 
so that the only option is success. And because you've committed yourself to that result, when I left my corporate job as an engineer to a major semiconductor company, I committed myself mentally, emotionally, spiritually to living the lifestyle of my dreams. By burning out all of my bridges, all of my ties to the company, potentially for getting my job back instantly vanished as options. Potentially for getting my job back instantly vanished as options. Even if I went back to begging for my job, no job would be available to me. Success became the only option. You could do the same thing with your goal. Decide what you want, commit to it, and systematically burn all the bridges that might be standing in your way. Section 2. Gaining Momentum. Chapter 5. Confidence is a Process. It's not what happens to you what determines how far you will go in life. It is how you handle what happens to you. Zig Ziglar Confidence is not a thing. It is a process. You may still have been thinking of confidence as something that you either have or do not have. But that's not the case. Calling something confidence is actually a misnomer. There's only such a thing as acting confident or behaving in a confident way or thinking confident thoughts. The same goes for any emotion, be it fear, sadness, depression, or anxiety. None of these are actual things. They are all results of processes, sequences of thought that you run in your mind. Up until now, you may not have been aware that you were doing this, but the vital point to realize is that you have complete control over these processes. You can decide whether mental processes are useful or which are not, and if they are useless, you can stop, interrupt, and banish them. By changing your language, you change your life. As we saw in the introduction, Neuro Linguistic Programming NLP shows how language, both verbal and nonverbal, affects your mind. The language that you use to describe what you are feeling impacts your feelings tremendously. It is your knowledge and this awareness of these processes that gives you the power over them. When somebody says he or she is depressed, that person has done is built in the notion into his or her mind of that very being. People cannot, they can't be depressed all the time. If they were, they wouldn't call it depression. It'd just be their normal state of being. Instead, people who consider themselves depressed should be saying, I run a process through my mind that causes me to experience certain feelings that I have collectively labeled as depression. The same goes for anxiety. Releasing the past. Think about, think about who you were in the past and who cares if you were shy if you weren't confident in the way that you wanted to be. The past is behind you. There's nothing that you can really do about it now and the best thing you can do is learn from it and behave differently in the future. To the end. And to that end, I want you to forgive your former self, being shy of not being acting confident in the past. So often, people spend their valuable time and energy kicking themselves for the time and opportunities that they lost as a consequence of being shy. To stop now before you read any further. So, so stop now before you read any further. And if you were unconfident or shy in the past, forgive yourself now. Release all those feelings of negativity and frustration and anything bad you might have against your shy former self. Because that version of you is over. We're going to learn from the past and we're going to move on. Get rid of negative emotions. Getting rid of negative emotions. Let's begin to blow out all the negative emotions. A great place to interrupt and banish those useful thoughts, processes, is to consider the language that you use to describe them. Let's just say if you feared public speaking, you would have described as fears if you say, I have a fear of public speaking. You are, in a sense, taking ownership of something that is just a mental process. What if you were to describe what is really happening and say, well, when I think about public speaking, I run a process in my mind that I have labeled as fear. How much does this change the things for you? How much better do you feel knowing that what you previously described as a fear of public speaking is really just a process that you can reverse? Beginning now to notice how you've been describing other negative emotions. Have you been saying anything like, I always get nervous when I talk with strangers or talking to customers makes me anxious. I just feel depressed or instead saying, I feel sad. Describe yourself for what's really going on. I choose to think in a certain way that results in my feeling sad or when I encounter a certain set of circumstances. It may sound a bit hokey at first, but as you continue to think about it and really dig into the meaning of that sentence, you will begin to gain a sense of how truly liberating this is. Add positive emotions. Now after taking control of these processes, insert a positive emotion in place of the negative one. I have absolute confidence in public speaking. Try that one out. The negative processes does, it serves you. And if you catch yourself running in these negative processes, interrupt it inside of your mind and yell, stop. Make it a habit to stop the negative process and automatically start the resource. 
Chapter 5. Confidence is a Process. Part 2. Gaining Momentum. If not, what happens to the bitch better have my money voice to suit you. Congratulate yourself when you stop the negative processes and praise yourself when you start a confident process because you get more out of what you reinforce. Praising yourself gives you the incentive to run the resourceful process. Naturally, you'll be more likely to do it again in the future. After all, you should treat yourself well. Some people have negative internal voices nagging at them all day. How awful would it be to live like that? Remember, the only way, the only person with whom you spend all your time with is, is yourself. So you might as well have a great rapport with yourself. Also, don't forget to congratulate yourself whenever you step outside of your comfort zone. Celebrate the successes and rewards and reward yourself accordingly. Consider the example of Janet, a rookie salesperson. Janet finds herself saying, talking to customers is scary. It's frightening to me. I feel fear when I go out and ask them to purchase my product and I don't know what to do. What is occurring here is Janet has given up her personal power of using disempowerment language. And if you were to re if we were to reward her language in a way that would allow her to easily change her perception of the situation, the translation would be, well, according to me right now, talking to the customers causes me to experience a certain emotion that I describe as scary. I choose to allow my customers to frighten me and feel something that I label as fear when I ask them to purchase my product, and I don't know what to do yet. Here is what Janet can do to immediately gain control of her emotions. Append. Append, according to me at this time, Onto every one of her sentences, this forces her to acknowledge that what she is describing is not absolute truth. It's not etched in stone for all time. According to me at this time, it's not the absolute truth. Whenever there is an unwanted emotion, like fear or guilt or anxiety, she must describe the emotion with the following phrase. Well, I choose to experience a certain emotion by doing something inside of my mind that causes me to experience a set of pictures, sounds, feelings that I collectively have labeled as an emotion. This requires Janet to take fixed emotion and turn back into a process. It is also demonstrates that she is one of the one in control and of that process. When she scratches or catches herself using the disempowerment language, after she restates it using the guidelines above, she must empower herself by using sentences that state how she will behave in the future. An example, although I have done this in the past, I wonder how quickly I can find myself becoming more relaxed and confident when I go to ask customers to purchase my products. Now, as you would go through this example and see how it's done, you will realize that you could do it too. Unwanted Emotions Exercise. The Unwanted Emotions Exercise, it's time. It's now time for you to think of five unwanted emotions and context them with you, which you ex experience those emotions. While you do that, become cognizant of the language that you are using to describe what you really do to experience those unwanted emotions. And think of emotions that would best fit in their place after you rid yourself of the unwanted ones. Following that, do the exercise of changing your current language and adding in more empowering language. Remember, what you do to change your language is what you'll do to change your life. Throughout the rest of this book, you'll be learning many more effective, simple ways to use language and many more mental processes that will give you unstoppable confidence. Chapter 6. Your Beliefs and How They Affect You If you develop an absolute sense of certainty that powerful beliefs provide, then you can get yourself to accomplish virtually anything, including those things that other people aren't even certain are possible. Anthony Robbins the next step is to take a close, hard look at our beliefs and to find out what they really are and what we really want out of life. Your current beliefs realized. Pause for a moment and consider everything around you. Everything that you have, everything that you lack stems directly from beliefs of yours. Similarly, similarly, all of your experiences that you've had and all of those experiences yet to be had are because of your beliefs. Beliefs are pervasive throughout our areas of life. They influence what we do and how we do it in any extraordinary degree. Your quality of life depends upon your quality of dis of depends upon the quality of your beliefs. The more useful and empowering the beliefs you hold, the more success you will attract. Understanding why we have beliefs and more importantly, how we can un how can we consciously change them is the most important of the key precepts of NLP. Beliefs are very influential in our lives. They have the ability to spur us into action and fulfill our dreams, or to keep us stuck in a mediocre situation. 
The difference that makes the difference is the quality of your beliefs. By observing a person's actions, you can deduce what beliefs he or she holds dear. If someone has a successful and happy relationship, you can deduce that he or she believes strongly in commitment to his or her partner. If someone has well-adjusted children, you can deduce that parents believe in taking pride in being good parents. If someone is fit and muscular, you might as guess that this person has a firm belief in health and fitness. How beliefs are formed. As we go through our lives, each of us gains different sets of experiences, learns to derive meanings from them. These lessons go long ways towards forming our beliefs. We acquire beliefs not only through our own experiences, but through and also learning from authoritative figures in our lives. These people have a way of passing on our lives and beliefs to us. Usually, when we are young children, the authoritative figures are our parents or school teachers. During this period, we do not consciously filter out what we don't want to believe in or try to determine whether a belief is empowering to us. Since they are authority figures, we simply adopt their beliefs as if they were uncontestable facts. Now, this is useful since there's so much for children to learn, yet sometimes the same well-meaning authority figures passes on a less than beneficial belief. As adults, however, we should realize that this is a better way, which is to adopt beliefs based on, um, based on their utility to us. Ask yourself whether a particular belief serves you. If so, keep it. If the belief keeps you stuck in a station of your life where you and you've already outgrown it, then get rid of that belief and replace it with a more empowering belief. You can learn something from each and every person that you encounter, whether it's something positive that you want to incorporate into your own life or something negative that you want to avoid. When you find what that someone has as far as empowering beliefs in a certain area, you can adopt those beliefs for your own. Similarly, if someone tries to pass a limited belief onto you, you can filter that one right out. Consistently remain aware of your beliefs and about certain things in different contexts. For example, you can wear a rubber band around your wrist and snap it every time you catch yourself uttering something less than empowering. This will cause your mind to associate that belief with pain. And since the mind wants to avoid pain at all costs, eventually you eliminate that belief. Make it a habit to eliminate the beliefs that you notice tend to be useless or that are holding you back. Make it a habit to believe even more strongly in the empowering ones. Sometimes people mislabel their feelings and create faulty beliefs. For example, if someone gets excited before making a sales pitch and mistakenly labels the feeding as fear, this person may create a belief that selling is always going to be scary. The next time he goes out to sell, he will be even harder for him to sell to perform at his optimum level since he believes he's about to get scared. That's a belief that should clearly be lost. Pay close attention to how you label your emotions because that will determine whether you create useful beliefs or useless ones. The structure of beliefs. Beliefs are structured in one of two ways, meaning or, caus or causality. Meaning or causality. When you either meaning or causality language explained below, you'll know someone is sharing his or her beliefs with you. A person finds it useful to listen for signs of other people's beliefs in case they have a more empowering belief one than the one you currently hold. So listen to people's beliefs. If they do, I know that I can replace my beliefs with theirs. Using the same idea, if I notice that they hold beliefs that I find less than useful to myself, I simply respect their belief and avoid adopting them as my own. Meaning beliefs. The meaning beliefs reveal that someone's considering a definitive explanation of a given subject. Causality beliefs reveal what someone considers the definitive correlation between two subjects. Whenever you hear one of the following words, someone is imposing one of his or her beliefs. When someone says means, when someone says is, or causes, or because, means, is, causes, because. When you hear someone else's beliefs, it's important to realize that they are not necessarily true. Sometimes people forget the fact that it's accidentally take on one less than empowering beliefs as their own. This is especially true for people listening to authoritative figures. They may forget to question what purpose it serves by the beliefs the authority figure is trying to promote. The qualities of beliefs. Beliefs are certain qualities that allow them to be encoded as beliefs in your mind. Each belief, certain visual, auditory, emotional quality associated with it, see the appendix for a list of specific qualities. By altering any of these qualities, we alter the belief. By consciously directing our minds, we can deliberately manipulate these qualities in order to keep only the most empowering beliefs, visual qualities of experiences. Movie stars are often adored to the point from which they are mobbed by fans depicted in a larger than life. This reason is because they are literally presented to the audiences larger than life on a huge movie screen in theaters. In the same way, you think about a certain things that though are viewing them on a mental movie screen. These things will seem quite compelling. If you have something positive 
that you want to experience more vividly, you enlarge whatever you are visualizing, make it a movie screen size in your mind, and notice how the feeling becomes more intense. You can make the belief even more intense by making it brighter in your mind, picturing it being closer. It's just like switching seats to move the front row in a movie theater. When you visualize a belief or a memory as a brighter and close, you will experience the feeling as much more intense. The reverse is also true. If you want to make something less powerful, you can visualize it being small, dark, and far away, and to listen to intensity even further. This can make the picture of what you're thinking about grainy, black and white. And though you are viewing it on the ancient television screen, high definition color movies are more compelling and they inspire people in ways that black and white movies cannot. Remember, make all the positives in your life big, bright, close, and colorful. Push away all the negative in your life into a small, dark, far away, black and white. People often encode their experiences to make the negative ones big and glaringly bright, while their positive experiences are small and much less vivid. Doing this will give people more negative dispositions because the negative images are so compelling in their minds. Deliberately taking charge of your own mind means encoding your experiences and beliefs in the most useful way. Auditory qualities of experiences. Just as visual qualities experience the beliefs affect their intensity, so do the auditory qualities. Going back to a movie theater analogy, people have more intense experience with the sound is loud. Engulfing them in stereo surround, a crystal clear bass reverberates with their bodies. Contrast the idea with a movie theater that has a low volume monotone sound that constantly interrupted by a popping static. The latter kind, the latter kind of sound is much less compelling than the former. Consequently, there is much less feeling associated with it. Learning to Listening to a movie in, in a theater with a weak sound is a completely different experience than going to a theater that has a powerful sound. We can deliberately alter our experiences and power of our beliefs by altering the sound qualities associated with it. By turning the volume up and down, changing the location or pitch of the sound, we can experience feelings differently. Emotional qualities of experience. By altering the visual and auditory qualities of our beliefs and experiences, we change the feeling associated with them. If you want excellent feelings, you need to see and hear excellent sights and sounds. Now you need to understand how to deliberately change your memories, experiences, beliefs. You can practice making your positive memories even better. Your negative memories more neutral and very powerfully lock in your most empowering beliefs. How to change your beliefs for good using the NLP. Now we're going to take you what we've learned about beliefs in order to change them perhaps faster and more effectively than you've ever dreamed possible bust the shy gene in earlier chapters we saw that there are really no such thing as being shy or having a shy gene so the first belief that we will change is the belief that you are shy you are going to take an old thought of self-esteem and images you have had about being shy and replace them with thoughts of images of being confident moving through the world in a whole new way don't confine yourself into using this technique just one belief you can use it for any beliefs that you have been holding that have been holding you back use this method to change whatever beliefs you find less than glorious or less than resourceful read throughout the instructions a few times to familiarize yourself with what you are about to do you may also want to get a partner to help you guide guide you through it someone who is supportive of your transformation perhaps someone who is similar transformation journey your partner can read these instructions out to you or you can simply take a note of these instructions and then close your eyes and then do it then you have certain mental pictures sounds and feelings that are associated with beliefs what we're going to do is change the structure of the belief and thereby change the belief itself by altering the structure of the belief we alter your mind and how your mind encodes it the mind encodes powerfully it the mind encodes powerfully held beliefs differently from weakly held beliefs. First, we will find out how you doubt something. The way in which we encode doubting beliefs in your mind. Then we'll bring you back to the normal neutral state of being. Third, we'll discover from which way strong beliefs are encoded in the mind. We'll again bring you back to the normal neutral state of being. Finally, we will bring you to... Finally, we will bring about a change in your beliefs. We will take your limited belief and turn it into a doubt. By doubting your limited belief, you will free yourself from it. We will then take a new and more empowering belief and lock it into your minds to be held strongly. Step 1. Discover how to doubt. The first thing you need to do is close your eyes and think of something that you've used to believe and is that you believe no longer. For example, you might think about it as a child you believed in Santa Claus, from which you no longer do. And as you recall the belief, become aware of everything you see that is associated with the belief. More importantly, 
since you are paying attention to the structure of the belief look at the different visual qualities of the belief and make note of them reading what you see your belief that is no longer true but used to be answer these questions is it flat or three-dimensional what size is it is it clear or out of focus how bright is it your eyes still close tune into the sound that's associated with the belief of yours that is no longer true listen closely and pay particular attention to the sound qualities as you answer the following questions do you hear voice of doubt do you hear a voice of authority do you hear other sounds how loud are the sounds that you hear and step two break state open your eyes take a deep breath and name three different things in the room that will help you shift from a state of doubt back to your neutral state you will even want to physically move around a little bit and helps you return to your neutral normal state step three discover how you believe think of something that is absolutely true pick out something that you have no question about that you believe 100 percent about to be true choose something simple like the sun will rise tomorrow or I need to breathe in air to live we're going to elicit the same visual and auditory qualities in this powerful belief that we just elicited for the doubted belief just as you did before when you think about this absolutely true belief become aware of everything you mentally associated with it remember since we're paying attention to the structure of the belief pay attention to the structure of the belief look at the different visual qualities of the belief and make a note of them regarding what you see and your strongly held belief answer these questions is it flat or three-dimensional what size is it is it clear or out of focus how bright is it with your eyes still closed tune in the sounds that are associated with this belief that are absolutely certain listen closely pay particular attention to the sound qualities as you answer the following questions do you hear voice of doubt do you hear voice of authority do you hear other sounds how loud are the sounds that you hear step four break state when you're done making note of all the qualities from which you see and hear open your eyes take a deep breath name three different things in the room that will help you shift back to a neutral state you may want to physically move around a little to help you return to your neutral normal state step five is change the belief think of limited beliefs of yours since this book is about confidence think of one that relates to your confidence or shyness a good example is is I can't go up and meet strangers easily this belief that limits many people whose social and business lives would improve if they rid themselves of it once you've selected your limited beliefs regarding confidence or shyness close your eyes and notice all the visual and auditory qualities of that belief this is just what you've done in steps one and three after you've gotten the visual and auditory qualities of your belief begin to change each and every visual auditory quality of your limited belief to match all the visual and auditory qualities of something that you used to believe but no longer do an old belief this process recodes your limited belief transforming it into something that you no longer believe make sure the visual and auditory qualities of the limited belief match those of the old belief as precisely as possible when you're done transforming that belief open your eyes take a deep breath and reorientate yourself back into a neutral normal state of being congratulations on removing a limited belief since nature abhors a vacuum we will place an empowering belief in your mind where it is limited belief used to reside to do this think about something with respect to your confidence that you believe it will improve your life now as you close your eyes think of what you want to fully believe and as you become aware of the visual and auditory qualities of your life begin to change in each of its every quality to match precisely the visual and auditory qualities of one of your strongest absolute true beliefs when you process it complete you will think of this new empowering belief in the way that you thought of your absolute empowering belief in the same way that you thought of your other absolute true strongly held belief in step three ensure the visual and auditory qualities of this new absolutely true belief and your previous true beliefs match up as much as possible again when this process is complete you will think of this new empowering belief in the same way that you your thoughts of others are absolutely true strongly held beliefs in step three ensure the visual and auditory qualities of this new absolutely true belief and your previous true beliefs match up as much as possible belief changing patterns number one close your eyes number two think about something that you used to believe was true but no longer do then number three notice the visual qualities of the belief number four notice the auditory qualities of that belief 
Number five, notice all the emotional qualities of that belief. Six, open your eyes. Name three different things in the room to clear your mind. Number seven, close your eyes again. Number eight, think about limited beliefs that you have, such as I'm shy or I'm not confident. Notice all the visual qualities of that belief, all the auditory qualities of that belief. Notice all the emotional qualities of that belief. And then number 12, open your eyes and name three different things in the room to clear your mind. Finally, number 13, adjust your limited belief to resemble something you used to consider true but no longer do. And I encourage you to practice changing your beliefs and experiences. You'll be surprised how easy and effective it is. Use expectancy to your advantage. What you expect tends to be realized more often than you might think. Resourceful people have different beliefs from those who are not resourceful. Resourceful people expect to be able to find a way to achieve their outcome. They expect to be able to easily and naturally form a rapport with anyone they meet. When they want something to happen, they often go for it. And if they make a mistake, they learn from the feedback. These expectations tend to influence a resourceful person's outcome. Believing the following ideas will increase you in interpersonal skills and personal effectiveness. When you meet people, you want to create rapport. Remember these beliefs. People automatically like you because you are a good person. You can easily and naturally meet anyone you choose. You can have instant rapport with anyone you choose using these techniques. You have a lot in common with any person you meet. You can learn something from each and every person you speak with. You may be thinking that these beliefs are not necessarily true, and if so, you, you would be correct. However, we're not out to get a result, not to logically prove what is or isn't, but above beliefs are using useful generalizations that will help you when you believe them. In all interper interpersonal relations, assume that you can get and maintain a rapport. Operate under the belief that you have far more in common with that person than not in common, and you will easily connect with him or her. Diffuse limiting beliefs with the power of question. The following method uses questions that are designed to break up limited beliefs. These questions help you reconnect with your confidence resources. Remember that you have confidence within you. You have confidence within you all times. You will have success. You will have successfully been confident in the past. The key is to summon the necessary confidence whenever you choose. Now, if you hesitate or Behaving, behaving tentatively, ask yourself, what's stopping me from doing what I want? Once you have the answer to this question, you can transform the frame of mind, your internal dialogue, and your physiology into a state of confidence. If, in fact, you do find yourself acting shy, never beat yourself up over it. Remember that there's a positive intention behind every behavior. That means that the way you were acting served as a purpose to ultimately do some good in the past. Figure out what positive intention of your shy behavior is by asking yourself, what is the positive intention of this tentative feeling? By silent, be silent, and allow the genuine answer to pop up in your mind. When you get an answer, take a note of it and then remind yourself that that shyness is an outdated way of behaving and that you will choose confidence from here on onward. Be good to yourself at all times. Never ask yourself a question like, why am I shy? Asking questions like that will only keep you stuck because your unconscious mind will come back to you with the answers about why you are shy, thus reinforcing the shyness even further. That's the last thing you want. You want to ask questions that reconnect you to your resources of confidence. Ask yourself, what would it be like if I were feeling unstoppably confident right now? How would it feel? How would you feel? Would you feel different? How would you look at the world as a supremely confident person? By merely answering the empowering questions, you will be forced to access a state of confidence thereby meeting your desired outcome. Chapter 7 Unstoppable Confidence in Personal Relationships Do unto others as they would like to have done unto them. The Platinum Rule Interpersonal skills are fundamental to gaining unstoppable confidence. Simply knowing these interpersonal skills will dramatically increase your confidence. Because you know how people function, you will naturally be able to relate to anyone and anyone and everyone easily by the time you finish this book. The Universal Characteristics of Friendship Stop for just a moment and think about your best friend. You can probably picture that person clearly in your mind. As you hold on to that image, I want you to notice what is specifically what it is specifically that you like about that person. Chances are the qualities that you like about your best friend are related to the following three universal characteristics that make like that make people like one another. All friendships are based on this, these three. 
All friendships are based on similarity, cooperation, and praise. Similarity. People like people who they perceive as being similar to themselves. You and your best friend have things in common. These things may include attitudes, beliefs, hobbies, goals, dreams. More likely than not, you like to do the same things. Furthermore, you and your best friend probably have similar dislikes as well. The similarity principle can be used to enhance your interpersonal relations and increase your own personal confidence. There's a distinction between true similarity and perceived similarity. True similarity is actually having something in common with someone, while perceived similarity is matching someone's behaviors. Example, mirroring. So, that his or her subconscious mind perceives you as similar. Both kinds of similarity can help you improve your interpersonal relations. See part four for the exercise using perceived similarity. Cooperation. Cooperation. The next ingredient that ensures people will like each other in co is cooperation. It is the absolute necessity. Without cooperation, there can be no basis for friendship. People who cooperate with you, participate in activities with you, and generally agree with you are undoubtedly more likable to you than people who don't. If someone you consider your friend decides to stop returning your phone calls, starts canceling appointments on you, or is generally uncooperative, you would obviously be difficult to maintain the friendship with them, no matter how similar you are to this person. Praise. Praise is the third factor in making one person like another. The importance of praise is obvious. People like to be praised, complimented, and recognized for their achievements. At work, employees often become disgruntled, not because they are uncompensated well monetarily but instead because their hard work goes unrecognized. Just a praise unites people in harmony, puts down insults, and divides peoples. It is much harder to like a person who puts you down than someone who consistently praises you. If your best friend did, not, if did nothing but insult you, you would quickly dissolve that friendship. Perceiving others. How you perceive people will influence how they perceive you. If you love people and enjoy their company, that belief, that belief will impact your life tremendously. Again, if you love people and enjoy their company, if you love people and enjoy their company, the belief will impact your life tremendously. And on the flip side, if you dislike people and generally disdain their company, that belief will affect you in just the same way. The better you can get along with people, the higher quality of life you will lead. Intention. Let's discuss the concept of intention. Intention is the subtext of the interaction between people. The intention. If you intend to connect with someone before beginning to talk to them, him or her, you will project the intent that the person will unconsciously pick up on it, responding to you more positively than he or she may have otherwise. People want acceptance. They want to relax and be themselves, free of any judgment. When you set someone else's comforts as one of your own outcomes, that person will find him or herself automatically more comfortable in your presence. The person may not know why he or she feels relaxed around you, but he or she will feel it. A positive frame of mind. Do the following an experiment to reveal the influence of your frame of mind. For a week, make yourself believe that people are all unfriendly and don't like to meet you and they don't like to meet new people. Imagine that they don't want to be bothered at all. After temporarily adopting this frame of mind, you go out each day, night and week and try to strike up a conversation, day conversations with strangers, and it will be difficult because of your frame of mind. What the thinker thinks is the prover proves, the prover proves. Having these preconceived negative beliefs become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Once the week is over, pure purge yourself of that toxic frame of mind. The following week, adopt the belief that people are perfectly friendly and they love meeting new people, dynamic people such as yourself. Furthermore, recognize that you like to get to know new people yourself and since you can learn something new from each and every person you meet, you can accept people for who they are. Allow them to be themselves and free themselves from judging them. After permanently adopting this frame of mind, you can go out each day or night or week and notice how easily it is, naturally it is for you to converse with strangers. One of many beliefs is having a confidence is how other people are putting in ease when you interact with them and the confidence with you. Again, one of many benefits of having confidence is how other people are put at ease when interacting with the confidence and the confident you. If someone is uptight and ill at ease, other people can sense it and that may act correspondingly uptight. However, when someone is genuinely comfortable in being him or herself, others sense it as well and consequently it lets their guard down. While you do these experiments and see yourself on how influential positive frame of mind works and is, Remember to have fun. Just go out and experiment. Play and practice your new skills. Adjust your behavior continually based on the feedback that you receive and eventually you'll find yourself just where you want to be when you're meeting new people. Pitfalls to avoid. 
There are several pitfalls to avoid as you develop unstoppable, confident, interpersonal relationships. As you develop your unstoppably confident interpersonal relationships, avoid overcome intimidation. One thing that you may encounter on your journey to connect and click with other people is feeling intimidated and intimidation. Many of these things can cause a person to feel intimidated, including a beauty, fame, fortune, social status, others. People possessing these qualities can seem intimidated. It is important to remember, though, that feeling intimidated, like shyness, fear, anxiety, and other emotions, is a result of mental process. Remember, who's in control? You are. If you ever find yourself feeling intimidated while dealing with someone, recognize the feeling as soon as you feel it, and by becoming aware of it and identifying it, you could do something about it. Take a few steps back and look into the picture. You are two people talking to an interacting. Take a few steps back and look at the big picture. You are two people talking or interacting in some fashion. It's really not such a big deal. The other person is simply a person the same way you are a simple and simple person. When you trip when you strip away everything else whoever it is that intimidates you puts their pants on the same way that you do remember this will eliminate intimidation and help you build the unstoppable confidence within you in terms of dating some people always think that the object of the other of their affection is way out of their league in terms of dating some people always think that the object of their affection is way out of their league that is utter and complete nonsense people are people no one is below or above anyone else. Beautiful people who might intimidate others are simply human beings with beliefs, desires, values, hopes, dreams, fears, and goals like anyone else. When you think about it in that way, doesn't it make it much easier for you to interact with people? That everyone, and even beautiful people, they might be intimidated as well. They're simple human beings with beliefs and desires and values and hopes and dreams, fears, and goals like anyone else. Now, as you apply these ideas in your life, I think you'll find that it does. If I ever feel intimidated by someone, it beca it's because I'm focused on the wrong attribute. All of us have extraordinary gifts. If others focus solely on our gifts, they might become overwhelmed and thus intimidated. We're all human beings and we all have much, much more in common than we have in differences. If I feel intimidated, it's because I'm not only dwelling on someone's extraordinary gift, but I'm also blowing that person way out of proportion. I'm totally exaggerating and making that person seem larger than life. A useful belief in dealing with someone who has a potential of intimidating you is to realize that you have at least something in common with every person that you meet. People have more in common than others think or even realize. Most people want to be happy, prosperous, take care of their families, enjoy their lives, and have freedom to pursue whatever they want. And when you keep these beliefs in your mind and you talk to you talk when you talk to a person, you will discover the connection between you and the two are deeply as a result of your projecting that similarity to the other person. Beware of mind reading. The second pitfall in mind reading, mind reading occurs when you pretend to understand someone's internal state without actually communicating with that person. People mind read often. It is almost always in their detriment. It is, al it is almost always to their detriment. Sometimes people will mind read about what others think of them. I know I've done it from time to time. You may have to. What someone thinks in his or her mind could be completely different from what you might think to be from reading off of that person. If a friend fails to call you back as a customer does not get back to you immediately, if a friend fails to call you back or a customer does not get back to you immediately, he or she may not be interested in you or you project or he or she may have just accidentally forgotten. There are many different potentials causing for everything and the only way to verifiably know is to ask someone. For the next week, practice becoming aware of whether you're mind reading. If you're automatically presuming to know someone else's private thoughts, stop and ask yourself. Stop trying to presume someone else's private thoughts. Ask yourself, how do I know? Have I asked this person? Or has this person communicated this to me? Are there other possibilities from the way this person is doing a certain behavior? And when you are aware of this, and you are of that in the mind reading, stop at once. Fortunately, we can mind read in a positive way too. I know that I just told you that the mind reading is something less than useful, and it does not lead to good communications. With everyone running around you pretending to read other people's thoughts, however, when you mind read positively, it can actually be very useful. When I was overwhelming and overcoming my shyness, I had difficulty meeting strangers and in a particular and in a particular woman. I used to mind read and say, oh, she won't like me. She wants to be left alone and this led me to be shy. Fear of rejection became incapacitated in my own shyness and then I decided I'd had enough of mind reading negatively. I will never read someone mind I would never mind read someone negatively again ever for the rest of my life. Never ever 
read somebody negatively, mind read negatively ever again. And then I decided I had enough. From the mind reading, and from this point on, I would avoid mind reading. Or, if I was going to mind read, I would do it positively. Only positively. I figure if you're going to mind read, you might as well do it positively. And when I began to do this, my confidence immediately swelled up. I would mind read people from whom I wanted to meet, telling myself that these are their thoughts. Oh, well, I hope that he, as in me, comes over and talks to me. I sure would like to meet a nice, friendly, easy-going guy right about now. How nice would it be for him to come over? When I thought of this, I was more often than not helped and to approach people and meet them. If you're going to use mind reading at all, use it to your benefit. Respond resourcefully to criticism. Now that you've learned to stop assuming people are speaking ill of us, we will learn how to respond resourcefully to criticism, and others have actually made it to... Uh, made it to or about us. This is a very useful tool in improving our interpersonal relationships. If someone is stepping off the beaten path and pursuing his or her passions, there will be criticism. Again, if someone's stepping off of the beaten path and pursuing his or her passions, there's going to be criticism. But it doesn't matter whether the person's criticizing you deliberately or wants to hold you back or not. The effect of the criticism can be the same either way, if you do not respond to it resourcefully. Usually criticism of someone is going after his or her dream signifies an element of jealousy or ignorance and on the part of the critic, otherwise the critic person, the critical person would be supportive and actually cheer you on. Recognize before you go after your dreams that you're putting yourself out there to potentially be criticized. Avoid letting that stop you. Instead, just understand that it may happen whether you warranted it or not. Whether you warranted it where whether it is warranted or not. Two resourceful responses to criticisms are first, ignoring it altogether. It's a good move. And the second, mining the criticism for valuable feedback. Make a distinction between the kinds of criticisms you receive and determine which response you would like to utilize. The first kind of criticism will be from the person who you are trying to tear you down in order to feel better about themselves. The other kind of criticism comes from people who mean well and do, but in fact they have good intentions of wanting, to impro wanting you to improve. But remember, the people who treat you how you've taught them to treat you. People that remember that people treat you how you've taught them to treat you for people giving you destructive criticism inform them that they need to correct their behavior for people giving you destructive criticism inform them that they need to correct their behavior in order to respond resourcefully to criticism there must be some sort of distance between you and the criticism so that you have time to digest it as you listen to the criticism imagine that you were surrounded by a thick glass barrier and absorbs any negativity and or negative emotions from the criticism so that only the useful positive content of the message seeps through other people may see and hear things differently from you and therefore have good suggestions for you on how to improve which is why you need to be able to receive positive, constructive criticism. Teach people how to give you good feedback. Good feedback comes from the form of a sandwich. The structure is praise for something done well, suggestions for improvement, and then some more praise for other things done well. When people use this sandwich, it helps actually. People use this feedback sandwich. The person receiving the feedback feels good while still getting useful ideas on how to improve. When giving constructive criticism, remember that the more specific the suggestions for improvement is, is, the more useful the suggestion will be. Again, when giving constructive criticism, remember that more specific the suggestion for improvement is, the more useful the suggestion will be. You got to be specific what you're trying to have suggestions of the improvement is on. The constructive criticism should enter, should center on how you improve next time. The constructive criticism should center on how you can improve next time instead of dwelling on it of what you did not do so well as far as this time around. Give others feedback in this way and expect the same from them. You'll be far more effective than you can even imagine. Again, the constructive criticism should center on how you can improve next time, on how you can improve next time. Whatever you say as far as constructive criticism, never dwell on it ever. It's just how you can improve next time. And instead of dwelling on it, of what you did not do so well this time around. Give others feedback in this way and expect the same from them. You'll be far more effective than you can imagine. Show confidence in interactions. The following ideas will get you started in demonstrating unstoppable confidence. In these interactions with others, more techniques for creating better personal relationships are found in part four. The Platinum Rule. In dealing with people, many have heard the golden rule. Everyone heard of the golden rule, but how about the platinum rule? The golden rule is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. No, the platinum rule is do unto others as they would like to have done unto them. 
When you think about it, the platinum rule is obviously makes more sense. If someone feels down and recognize it, you can proactively make that person feel wonderful. The magic of touch. People who are well-liked and confident put others at ease in their presence. One method they use is to put others at ease is to convey a warm feeling and the power of touch. People crave connection with other people. Touching and being touched by others, if applied correctly, can be powerfully a powerful way to make a connection. Whether it's a handshake or congratulatory pat on the back or a warm hug, people often respond to touch. As an example that demonstrates the power of touch, it is a study that was conducted with the waitresses. The researchers set out to determine how to touch would influence the tips the other waitresses earned. The first group of waitresses touched each customer while he or she ordered items off of the menu. The second group acted just as friendly, only they didn't touch the customers at all. The researchers found that the waitresses who touched the customers earned tips that were 50% higher than those of the waitresses who did not. What this shows is that the customers perceived the waitresses who touched them as more likable and open. Finally, a word of warning. You should apply touch ju judiciously and appropriately. Again, only judiciously and appropriately, never in a way that could be misconstrued as sexual or inappropriate. As with all things, use some common sense. Chapter 8. Overcoming Obstacles in the Path to Success In every adversity, there is a seed of equal or greater benefit. Napoleon Hill all the happiest, most fulfilled, most successful people realize that success is a process. It's a journey of who we become, not simply the end result that makes us all worthwhile. The achievement of the goal is sweet, but as with any goal worth achieving, there will likely be setbacks along the way. Viewing those setbacks in the right light can make the difference in your ultimate success. No such thing as failure. No such thing as failure. Thomas Edison did more than 10,000 experiments before he perfected the incandescent light bulb. Colonel Sanders, the founder of the chicken franchise, KFC, got 1,009 rejections before someone bought his chicken recipe. When Sylvester Stallone of Rambo fame showed up in Hollywood, he went through more than 100 auditions before someone cast him in a small role. What all these people had in common was that they did realize that there is no such thing as failure. There's only results, and after you've been knocked down, the only thing that matters is that you get back up. As Thomas Edison was developing the light bulb, newspaper reporter came to interview him about his experiments that had failed. And the newspaper record inquired to as to when the inventor would give up after failing so many times, which Edison retorted, never. The pressing newspaper report insisted, but you've kept failing over and over, and Edison swiftly responded, no, what you don't understand is that I have not failed. I've just found over 10,000 ways not to invent the light bulb. This is very true, and since he's learned from each previous experiment and made corrections based on his findings, masters become masters because they make more mistakes. The more mistakes you make, the better distinctions, small pieces of information you learn by doing, you'll get. The more distinctions you have, the more easily you will reach for your outcome. Think about that as it applies to your confidence and going after your dreams. Masters are excellent at fundamentals. They go back and ensure that they have gotten the basics down. If you at first are not successful, be thankful. Some of at least successful people are out out there. They've had early successes and decided that there was no room for improvement. Therefore, they became complicated and stagnated. stagnated. Compare this to people who fail royally the first times. These late bloomers have to develop skills to adjust their behaviors based on feedback. They tend to develop habits that lead them towards continual improvement. And as they develop these habits and begin to succeed, they eventually surpass the early bloomers in productivity. The four major causes of blunted progress. People short. People stop short of achieving success for many different reasons. And being aware of what stops other people can help you prevent yourself from being sputtered out of let's sputtered out. Now let's continue on the road towards living your dreams. A lot of the reasons, reasons that people prevent people from living their dreams are actually excuses. What I challenge you to do is systematically go through your life, kick out all the excuses, the crutches that you may have or been leaning on. Blow out the crutches permanently so that there can be no choice but success. This is one of the rare times of reducing your options will ultimately gain you more options in the future. Excuses are false options that will only hinder your progress. And since progress is vital to success, progress is vital to success, you mustn't let anything stand in your way. The four major causes of blunted progress is number one, the fear of change. Number two, fear of the unknown. Number three, the fear of success. And number four, the fear of failure. Fear of change. 
people are creatures of habit. A lot of us do the same things over and over again as in every day we rerun. This can be good in some context. Habits simplify our lives. We don't have to consciously think about how to drive a car, open a door, use a computer every time we do so. On the flip side, habits can become detrimental to our well-being if they act too much on our habits. We can become automatons and forget to make conscious choices about what we really want to do. Becoming confident is the breach of habit that people may fear. Since it involves an entirely new set of behaviors, attitudes, and values that differ from being shy, it is useful to believe that change is fun and easy. To change for the better leads to personal growth. Change for the better. Change for the better. Personal growth. And that lets you know who you really, that lets you know that you're really alive. It shows that you are really not stagnated. Sometimes at the start of a big change, it may be painful or seem to have negative effects. Always look on the bright side. Think long term. Dwell on how difficulty the experience is. Dwell on how the difficulty difficulty your experience in making the change can only help you down the line pretty soon you'll discover yourself doing these same difficult things automatically the more you practice the easier it gets fear of the unknown fear of the unknown is quite common even though it makes little sense to me life inherently has become unknown you just never know what's gonna happen you don't know what to expect all the time and your life would be completely drained or of spontaneity if you ever could and you would never have any enjoyment that wasn't mapped out beforehanded is this worth wasting your valuable time and energy contemplating on the unknown when you could just take it as it comes with an optimistic attitude of course it's the only natural it's only natural to make provisions that ensure the worst case scenario in each situation does not happen. Although, if the worst case scenario should happen, you can always minimize the damages afterwards. This is the fundamental shifting in your mindset here. It's the difference between taking action to preventing or minimizing the worst case scenario and not taking action because you're worried about something that something bad might happen. It's important to avoid spending your time worrying and fearing the unknown. Instead, take action and increase your peace of mind. Think of life as an adventure or a game where you make up all your own rules play by play and if you move through your life with a frame of mind like that how much more exciting and fun would your life be the fear of success some people subconsciously fear success this fear paralyzes them preventing them from taking a positive action successful people find ways to overcome this fear and that's one of the reasons why they are successful there's a myth that if you become successful you have to move in a different neighborhood and lose all your friends and the world as you know it will end, but if you subscribe to this theory, you are deluding yourself. Success comes in many forms, marital, spiritual, physical, mental, financial, and so on. And it is wonderful. Success is continually rewarding all of the people, and all the people should know that it's like to be successful, and what it's like to be successful in their own right. Sometimes people shun success because they think it will impose a higher standard on them, and consequently put them with more pressures on them to perform con consistently at the higher level it's true there's a higher standard and that the higher standard is set but who says you can't meet expectations once you've raised the bar you should always expect your excellence out of yourself you deserve to perform at a high level no matter what the context if you're merely continuing to perform adequately then you're just trying to not lose well if you continue to perform with an excellence then you are now in it to win performing with an excellence avoid playing the trying not to lose energy or the trying not to lose game always opt for the I'm playing to win this game instead fear of failure fear of, fear of failure stops many people from even going after what they want some people tend to dwell of what happens if they fail they focus on thoughts that will happen if nothing goes right when you do that you picture all sorts of negative hypothetical situations and eventually talk themselves out of doing something that could have been done wonderfully when people venture outside of their comfort zones and need to focus on their potential benefits and remembering it's important to go after them, after all, there's no such thing as failure. There's only results. You'll never fail again. You'll never fail again at anything again for the rest of your life. There's only results. And if you get results that you don't like, you'll naturally adjust your behavior based on the results to persist until you achieve your outcome. If you get results you don't like, you'll naturally adjust your behavior based on the results to persist until you achieve your outcome. To get past the fear of failure, answer the following question. To get past the fear of failure, getting past the fear of failure, answer the following questions. If you knew you could not fail at something, what would you do? What would you achieve? How would your life be different than it is now if you knew you could not fail? 
First, you must conceive it, then you must believe it, and then finally, you will achieve it. Your initial answers to these questions are outcomes that you should pursue. Go for it. Make them a reality. Remember the mistakes are great ways to learn. Mistakes are just a great way to learn. We all make mistakes sometimes, and the more we make them, the more better off we are. And since this means we're all learning faster than we better off we are. Since that means we'll be learning faster than if we weren't making any mistakes at all, as long as you avoid making catastrophic mistakes, the little ones make can make you can be your best teachers of how to do something the right way. Even if you did not even if you did nothing and tried your hardest not to make a mistake, mistakes could be impossible to avoid. Since doing nothing in or in itself would be a mistake, you are bound to making a mistake once in a while. So let's just make the most of them. The secret, start making the most mistakes as you can. One motto is to go by is this, fail forward fast, fail forward fast. Keep on making the mistakes and learn from them. Adjust and move on. Then repeat the cycle without making any mistakes. There's no personal growth. Without personal growth, there is stagnation. Be confident about mistakes. Be confident about mistakes. They are simply ways in which we learn. There's a success and a confident secret of go-getters all around the world. And after each success and they experience, they integrate that success into their identity as further evidence that they are unstoppable. And after each mistake, they start thinking simply as a byproduct of their behavior and learning opportunity. The mistake doesn't cast any doubt on who they are as people. Many people have their strategy flip-flopped. Instead of integrating the success as a part of who they are, they dismiss them, and that's all wrong. Dismiss the mistake as flukes, but not the successes. People downplay their successes with each phrase as, oh, I just got lucky, or oh, it's bound to happen sometime. Those phrases absolve the person from any responsibility for taking action and generating the success. Noting these phrases popping up and out of other people's language and yours too, then avoid using them even ever again. It wasn't luck. It was you. It wasn't luck. It was you. To get the victories to occur more often, just as soon as you have a major success, visualize yourself having the same results again in many different contexts. When you got the winning feeling, it's such easier to imagine it yourself having the same feeling over and over again in the future. Visualizing the victories is different contexts and it will help you create a belief that the success is part of who you are, not just an isolated incident that occurs from time to time. Here's how to be successful, and here's how successful people view their mistakes. Well, the mistake is simply a function of what I did not a part of who I am or who you are. A mistake is something to learn from. A mistake, a mistake lets you know that you should adjust your behavior. Here's how successful people view their successes. Success is part of who, I, who you are. It happens because you are a successful person. Success is something to congratulate yourself on and celebrate. Success can be built on to reach even greater heights in the future. The confidence you are rapidly developing can take to a form of a snowball. At first you pack the smallest bit of snow in your hands and make it as dense as possible so that it sticks together and then you place a small snowball on the top of the great big hill and as you roll the snowball down the hill the snowball gathers more and more snow and it gains momentum. Pretty soon the snowball is unstoppable and it keeps getting bigger acquiring more snow and faster. That's how your confidence is going to be growing now. You're packing the small snowball for the t snowball for the techniques in this book, pushing the snowball down the hill. With the snowball racing down the hill, you are stepping further and further outside of your original little comfort zone. You'll be amazed how surprised and delighted you'll find of how much you'll enjoy this wonderful personal growth. Once you adopt this belief that mistakes, once you adopt the belief that mistakes are your gateway to learning and natural parts of the process, your confidence will immediately begin snowballing faster. What makes the difference between successful, confident people and those who are tentatively tentative and do not pursue their dreams is the way that they actually view their mistakes. If you want to do something well, it's worth doing poorly at first. But that is why taking action is almost always better than taking no action at all. In taking action, you will either get your outcome or you at least get something so that you can do something even better the next time. If you fail, take action out of the fear. If you fail, take action out of fear. You will never learn nothing and stay stuck in the same place as you were. The confident man and the confident mindset allows you to make as many mistakes as you need to as fast as you possibly can. The key here is to correct what you're doing based on the feedback that you get regarding the mistake. Be constantly correcting. Eventually, you will get your desired outcome. And after you succeeded, you will learn to integrate the success into your identity as well as, the person, as, as, well as being a person of unstoppable confidence. The tentative mind sets and holds the mistakes that are, they tend to think that they're bad and they should be avoided. But as you become more confident in yourself, you'll naturally find how effective the tentative mind set is in terms of going after your dreams, how ineffective the tentative mind is. 
Mistakes are really only a measure of one specific instance of your behavior. They are not personal evaluations, and a mistake is just a moment that you had a mistake as far as a tentative or a temporary behavior. They are not a personal evaluation of your worth or your as you as an individual. Avoid taking mistakes personally. Don't take mistakes personally. Instead, learn from them and move on. Failure from an unstoppable confident perspective. Failure from an unstoppably confident perspective. Confident people are confident because they know that they can achieve anything they want. How do they do this? Because they have a history of persisting until they succeed, until they win, until they get what they want. They may experience temporary setbacks from time to time, but they always learn something from these and do something different, and eventually until they finally achieve their goals. So, how do you do this? Well, I'm reminding you of a story that you may have already heard. A group of frogs on a farm came across a bucket of milk and the farmer had accidentally left behind, and they dared each other to jump over the bucket, and they did, and over and over until the frog kept misjudging his jump and fell into the milk. He tried to scramble out of the bucket, when the sides were too slick, and he fell back in. He couldn't hear the other frogs laughing at him outside. Not only was he in danger of drowning, but the other frogs that but the other frogs that he thought were his friends were laughing about it. He was determined to get out, so he swarmed and jumped and flailed about. And the more he tried, the more they laughed at him. So he kept it up, and as he kept it up, all of his motions ended up churning the milk until it became butter. And when the butter was thick enough, the frog had enough leverage to jump up and out and escape. And what does this teach us? If you want something badly enough, you will achieve it, no matter how it happens, and no matter what happens, no matter what anyone says, even if those whom you thought were your friends tell you otherwise, always know that you can. Refrain from asking yourself a question like, Is it possible? Or can I do this? You already know that you can do it. Presuppose it is as a given. Presuppose it as given. You can accomplish whatever you set your mind to accomplish with the inevitability of achieving your goal already firmly established. Ask yourself, what is it going to take to accomplish my goal? What is it going to take to accomplish my goal? This question assumes that the possibility of success is already a definite in your mind. And now the only thing is to determine is how. Specifically, will you get there? Chapter 9. Act as if. Act as if. Quality persons create a quality life. Successful people ask better questions. And as a result, they get better answers. Anthony Robbins. So now you may be wondering how to get unstoppable confidence. We've talked about confidence. We've talked about what it is, what it isn't, as well as about aspects of your language and body systems and how they need changing. But how exactly do you get there? Parts 3 and 4 give you techniques and exercises to help you change your language and change yourself. To get started, here's the first step to set you on your journey to unstoppable confidence. Acting as if. Acting as if is an NLP essential. If you act as if something is real for long enough, you will eventually forget that you are only pretending. And however you are acting will become your habit. And this is one of the keys to neuro-linguistic programming. People who used to be shy have used this as-if frame of mind to develop their confidence. The difference between people who are confident and those who are shy are their habits. Habits can either be good or bad. The secret is to have a wealth of good habits. The more empowering habits you have, the better life will be. Developing these habits of behaving confidently can be enjoyable too. It's exciting to witness your personal transformation as you gain more confidence in yourself. The pretend it, have it technique. The pretend it, have it technique. The mind and body are part of a cybernetic system. This means that the body influences the mind and the mind influences the body. You can pretend to have a confidence, reliving confident experiences in your mind, which will get your body to adopt confident physiology. Or, if you choose to adopt confident physiology, your mind will adjust from what you are seeing, hearing, and feeling internally to experience confidence. You can use this to our advantage, and we should use this to our advantage. Getting confident is no different from pretending to have confidence. Keep doing it for long enough, and pretty soon you'll forget that you're pretending. And by the time you've done that, the confidence will become a habit. Following that, your confidence gets intergrained into your personality, and it becomes a part of your identity. Remember, times as a child when you played make-believe. Children have excellent imaginations. They're very good at playing and consequently learning. People make play make-believe now and pretend that you have the confidence before you really do have it. Here's some questions about confidence. Questions about confidence. Imagine what it would be like to be ten times more confident than you are now and answer the following questions. How would it be? How would you be moving differently? How would your body posture be different? 
How would your inner voice be different? How would you be speaking to others? What is going through your mind? How does your body feel? Where is your body? Where in your body do you feel the confidence first? How could you intensify that confident feeling in your body? By answering the questions, you can do what they invite you to do. You will see your unstoppable confidence soar. You will see your unstoppable confidence soar. When your confidence soars, forget that you are pretending and take action to do whatever you need to do to get done. When I was learning how to walk up to strangers and begin talking, I would ask myself these questions one by one. With each question I answered, I adjusted my behavior and pretended as if I already had the confidence that I was seeking. And after answering all the questions, I could actually feel unstoppable confidence within me. This propelled me to introduce myself to strangers and begin talking to them. The reverse of this technique is also true, so be forced-warned about that. If you think about shyness and adopt your body language, your mind and body will make you feel shy. But if you catch yourself doing this, acknowledge it, and then begin asking yourself the confidence questions, which are designed to get you into a super-confident state, into a super-confident state. Now work on your way through the techniques and strategize in parts 3 and 4 before long. You won't be acting unstoppably confident. You'll be unstoppably confident. Again, the questions about confidence are... How would you be moving differently? How would your body posture be different? How would your inner voice be different? How would you be when speaking to others? What's going through your mind? How does your body feel? Where does your body feel the confidence first? And how could you intensify this confident feeling in your body? Chapter 10. Mastering Your Internal Voice Make a game of finding something positive in every situation. 95% of your emotions are determined by how you interpret events to yourself. Brian Tracy Imagine a private radio station in your mind that broadcasts just for you. If the DJ put on a record that played a whining, droning voice constantly con cataloging your failures and griping of how hard life is, you'd feel pretty bad, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you want to turn it down or fire the DJ? Conversely, what if you could listen to rich, warm voice reminding you of all the great accomplishments of your life, the things that make you happy and thankful, the goals and your dreams that you have? Wouldn't that feel just great? Wouldn't you want to listen to that a lot? With the volume high enough for you to feel it vibrating throughout your body? Well, that's exactly what we are going to do in this chapter. By mastering some basic NLP techniques, neuro-linguistic programming, or self-talk, you are going to learn to be useful with your internal voice to positively change your state of mind and direct your thoughts in resourceful ways. No matter how you have been using your voice your whole life, using your voice ever, in the past, you will master your internal voice so that your state of mind becomes and stays absolutely fabulous. Squashing negative internal dialogue. Many people have a negative internal voice that is constantly eating away at them. This negative internal dialogue often dwells on bad things in life and is quick to put down in some other nasty comment. Consequently, it's difficult for people who moved ahead if they don't first conquer their negative internal voice. This kind of internal monologue can use and cause a negative self-fulfilling prophecy. If you let it rule your mind, you will also, it will also rule your world. What occurs far too frequently is that negative internal dialogue discourages someone from doing something bold and constructive. Then this person attempts to take the initiative and fails and internal voice rubs it in. This further drive homes in the false belief that a person cannot do whatever he or she has set up to do. This negative internal voice that becomes more powerful because it was right before and it incapacitates, incapacitates the person again next time he or she dares to try to step outside the comfort zone. This cycle must be stopped. Considering all of this, how would you like to silence this negative internal voice once and for all? First, first identify the qualities of your negative internal monologue by answering the questions listed here. When you're aware of the specific qualities of your negative internal voice, you can more easily silence it. Whose voice do you hear? Where does the voice seem to come from? At what level is the volume of that voice? Does the voice speak rapidly or slowly? Now, now that you are more consciously aware of the voice than ever before, you can squash it. To do this, you must actively choose to change the qualities of the internal voice. You can do this by imagining the same voice with no vocal properties altered. Sometimes the negative internal voice is that one of the both of your parents. Sometimes the negative internal voice is your own. What would happen if you took your voice and made it sound like, say, Mickey Mouse's voice? It would be hard to take that highly pitched voice seriously, right? 
Well, what would happen if you had made another favorite childhood cartoon character's voice for the other voices? Or perhaps a clown's voice? Don't take my words for it. Do it yourself and find out. The next time you recognize a negative internal voice, mentally repeat just what I said and make it the voice of Bozo the Clown. You might be surprised to discover how qu quickly an internal voice that used to keep you stuck becomes meaningless when it sounds like this. What happens if you put your negative internal voice? What happens if you change where your negative internal voice comes from? Put the voice in different locations and farther away to lessen the impact. Picture a voice coming out of your kneecap, softly taunting you about your shortcomings. Notice how this changes things. What happens when you speed that voice up so very fast that it is almost incomprehensible? like a record turned up to 180 RPMs. What happens when you slow that voice down so much that it's a deep and distorted that you can adjust your internal voice and though in the same volume dial? Turning the volume up or down in a suite of a situation, in the suit of a situation, most likely the quieter the voice, the less influential influence, influence it will have. Find that that works best for you. Find out what does and use it to thwart the impact of that pesky negative internal voice. The underlying foundation of this technique is the idea that you can consciously direct your mind instead of just allowing it to function on impulse. You can consciously direct your mind. With the techniques I've outlined, you will be consciously directing how you hear your internal voice. I bet you're feeling better about having more control over the negative internal voice and that voice is having less and less of an impact on you. Amplifying Positive Internal Dialogue And inhibiting as a negative internal voice is, a positive internal voice can be twice as effective in leading you to greatness. Everything that you have did, everything that we did in this last section to de-emphasize the negative internal monologue, you, well, now you'll learn to do this in reverse, to amplify the positive internal monologue. When you hear positive encouraging words inside of your mind, take a moment silently thank yourself. If you hear something positive or something upbeat in your mind, anything, take a quick second and thank yourself. Eventually, you won't feel the need to do so, but when you feel the confidence of your positive interior voice, congratulations are in order. As your internal voice bursts forth with positive words, reinforce them with the appropriate behaviors. The more you reward yourself in acting this way, the more in the way that you want, the more you will find yourself automatically acting in this way that you want. You won't even have to make it a point to do so. It'll simply become a reflex. Your ideal internal dialogue should be your own voice. The reason for it is, is that you and you alone run your life and make the decisions. If the internal dialogue is a voice of anyone other than you, you are effectively relinquished your personal power to that person. Since you are the one running your mind and your life, reclaim both by making an internal dialogue yours alone, forever. Simply re replace the current voice of authority in your life with your own voice. Let me own positive voice resonate within. Let your own positive voice resonate within and allow it to spread throughout your whole body. Wherever you're hearing, wherever you hear that glowing, positive internal voice, let it bloom from within like it's coming from the largest speakers that you ever heard with the loudest volume imaginable. The louder the volume, the more vividly you feel and it will course throughout your entire being. So when you want to really feel it, crank up the volume. While your positive internal voice shows up more and more often, sometimes it'll give you a positive statement disguised in a question form. As an example is, you can do it. The tone may be questioning, but in a deep voice sentence or a statement, ratchet up the power of internal voice by turning the sentence into a statement. You can do it. You can do it. Repeat in, in your mind a few times if you need to, and next make an internal voice even stronger by converting it to the statement into the exclamation. Like, instead of saying, you can do it, now you say, you can do it. Shout this instead inside of your mind so that there can be absolutely no doubt. Find your passions. Find your passion. Your confidence will grow with each and every technique that you add to your repertoire. The more your confidence grows, the more you will discover how much you want to reconnect with your passions and go after them. In doing this, ask yourself, if money were no object to you and you knew you could not fail, what would you do in your life? The immediate answer is the question in your passions. What should you do with your life? Using the technique you're learning in this book, stamp out the negative internal voice that might try to vein or crop up. Find your passion. Find your passion. Set your goals. 
and then take immediate, repeated, massive action that will virtually guarantee your success. Commit to yourself that you will never quit. Remind yourself that you have quit quitting. You have officially quit quitting and more and, the, and move ahead into the life that you want to deserve and you should have now. Chapter 11 Speaking the languages of confidence Dedicate yourself to the good you deserve and desire for yourself. Give yourself peace of mind. You deserve to be happy. You deserve delight. Mark Victor Hansen now that you've mastered our internal voices, it's time to turn our attention to our externals, how we project our internal dialogues to the outside world, the vocabulary of confidence. If you listen to other people talking, you will notice that those are confident use of certain vocabulary, and those lacking in confidence seems to draw their words and phrases from an entirely different dictionary. Most people don't give a lot of thought to the language that they use, as such people's habitual language patterns reflect back of their thinking, being confident thinking or lack thereof. Not only does language reflect a person's thinking, but it also reinforces a person's thinking. The key to use is the following information of transforming your everyday vocabulary. When this occurs, you will not only change your thinking, you'll change your life. So, what are these changes? I have assembled two sets of words that you must take into account when speaking. Two sets of words you must take into account when speaking. First, there's a set of words that you are absolutely need to eliminate from your vocabulary. And then there's a set of words that you need to memorize and integrate into your speech in order to project the maximum confidence. It is hard to overstate the importance of sending the right signals with your language, but it is easier learning to do so than you may think. Let's get down to it. The confidence killers. First, we'll tackle the set of words that need to be eliminated completely from your vocabulary. And if you catch yourself using this word, say, hey, wait a minute. I'm no longer shy. There's a better word for that. Don't beat yourself up when you hear yourself using one of these words. Just acknowledge that you've used the word in the past and increase your efforts to eliminate it from your vocabulary in the future. Try. The first word is try. Have you ever heard someone say, try to do it something? There's a difference between trying to do something and actually doing something. Quite simply, trying is lying. In Star Wars, Yoda said, there is no try, only do. Yoda was right on the money. There is no try. If you ask someone to do you a favor, the person can't say, well, I'll try. No, you can count on him or her for not doing the favor for you if they say, I'll try. Otherwise, the person would say, I'll do it. The word try communicates a maybe attitude in the world that craves certainty. Instead, use the word do. Say, I will do it. Eliminate the word try. Try is gone. Never say try again. Never say try again. Don't try to eliminate the word try. Just do it. The shy sentence. I try to do the laundry. I'll try to do the laundry tomorrow. The confident sentence. I will do the laundry tomorrow. Try becomes do. Try becomes do. Try is gone. No more try. It's do. Hope. Hope is another word that is not for confident people, is hope. Now, hope is a nice and pleasant word. However, it announces a lack of action. For example, I hope things will get better, or I hope my situation resolves itself. Contrast with, I'm going to make it better, and I'm going to make my situation better. Hoping that something is to happen is being reactive, whereas taking action and expecting success is proactive. The shy sentence, I hope I can take a trip to Hawaii someday. The confident sentence, I'm making plans to take a trip to Hawaii next year. But, but negates every word that proceeds in its sentence. But negates every word that precedes it in a sentence. As an example, I want to go to the movie, but I have a lot to do. In this example, it sounds as if the person will not be going to the movie. When someone hears the word but, he or she immediately knows that what was just about said should be just disregarded. If you want to communicate the same thing without using the word but, Dis substitute the phrase with and yet and yet the shy sentence I want to go but I have something else going on the confident sentence is I want to go and yet I have something else going on the three ouds the three ouds would could and should the ouds well here's the ouds would could and should as Dr. Seuss might have said, it was concerned with confidence. Here of the three uds, there are no good. As we, as we go through each ud, we'll discover how its usage is in some places decreases confidence. The uds are no good. We'll learn how to replace these words with 
that will propel you with furtherness into your success, propel you even further into your success. Would. Would is a conditional word. It's not confident, it's not absolute, but when I was discussing this notion writing a book, some people said, yeah, I would write a book too if... And then they give some reason why they supposedly precluded them from writing a book. Well, would, well, would is conditional and presupposes there's something standing in the way of success. It's pointless to use the word would because nothing can stop a confident person from achieving success. Eliminate the word from your vocabulary. The shy sentence is, I would talk to strangers now if only. The confident sentence is, I will talk to that stranger now. Could. If someone says, I could go meet that person, then my question is, well, what's stopping you? Using the conditional word could implies that there's an ex certain ex certainty attached to your action. For example, I could go meet that person or I could go to the mark. I could go market my business to 10 new people and expand it. Just as we've seen with the word would, could also suggest that there's something preventing you from achieving your goal. Could implies that there's a chance by the message it sends to don't count on it. Eliminate it from your vocabulary. It's much better to use more definite phrase such as I can or I can't. I can or I can't. Could is, it's, it's letting there's a chance that it won't be done. It's either I can or I can't. The shy sentence is I could try to make a speech in front of my peers. I could try making a speech. Confident person says, I can make a speech in front of my peers. Should. Should is the worst of all the uds. Should implies expectations and limited options. Think of the sentence, I should be doing this right now. Well, you should be doing this according to whom? Ask yourself that. Whose expectations? It's all with your own, within your own expectations. At least it's all about your own. Your own internal frame of reference. After all, you're running the show. You're leading your own life. You're a unique individual in charge of what you're doing. Saying should is like keeping yourself hostage by limiting your choices. Should... If you have preconceived notions that you should always do certain things in a given circumstance, then you're not going to investigate other options because you're not going to do what you should. And that's a limiting perspective because whenever you have fewer choices, you have less control over your life. Confident people don't have that problem, regardless of whether or not the situation dictates they should. The shy sentence. It's late and I should get home now. The confident sentence. Well, it's late and I choose to go home now. Confidence builders. The confidence builders. Now that we've talked about the words that uh, we're going to be eliminating from our vocabulary, let's discuss the words that will skyrocket your confidence when you integrate them into your daily thoughts and speech. The underlying principle and definition of purpose. Words that show confidence and let people know what you want. Words that show confidence and let other people know what you want. Here are the words and phrases to add to your vocabulary for enhanced confidence absolutely definitely positively assuredly without a doubt of course certainly undoubtedly obviously guaranteed naturally sure what do all these words do they communicate a message that there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that this is the way it is now as you begin to use these words notice how people respond to you because they will respond differently if someone asks what do you want to do there's a number of responses here are two examples the undecided sentence well we should do something fun I hope the confident sentence well I absolutely want to see a movie tonight you will notice the difference between someone who is confident and someone who wants to do something and someone who may want to do something yet is too shy to say what that might be the language of motivation now let's talk about how to use language to motivate yourself to do what you want you can take a task of action and that you don't particularly care about and crank up your motivation so that you just have to just do it model operators this goes back to our use of language and how it shapes our model of the world. With this technique, you will focus an aspect of language called model operators. When you listen to someone's language, and especially his or her model operators, you will hear so much about that person moves through the world and how the source of his or her is motivation. So what are model operators? They are words like must, have to, need to, will, can, should, would and so on 
For our purpose, they fit into three categories, necessity, possibility, and impossibility. Model operators of necessity. As model operators, necessity indicates that something is necessary and that something needs to be done, but they are words such as have to, need to, must, mandatory, and required. As such, using them in the right places in our language to excellence for motivation, I have to take a break. You need to go do some training. We must work on this project now. It's mandatory that you do your confidence exercises regularly. Model operators are possibilities. Model operators of possibilities are words such as can, could, might, possibly, maybe. These words are possible possibilities to us. When we use them correctly in our language, a model operators, not only one is the dreaded uds, they imply choice. We have no we have so many options we can pursue. I have I could make it at 9.30 p.m. sharp, easy. I could make it 9.30 p.m. sharp, easy. Perhaps we might consider the new developments. Model operators of impossibility. When you have a model operators of impossibility, these words are to imply that we simply cannot do something. Cannot is just one of those words. Cannot, will not, must not. Notice most model operators of impossibility close off options that may have been available to us. I'll never go back to the old way of being. You must not neglect the following these instructions carefully. I can't go a day without doing my unstoppable confidence exercises. How to easily motivate yourself. So how do we use this knowledge of the modal operators to crank up our motivation? How do we simply start chaining them together? I want you to follow along in this example. We will begin by saying a set of phrases. Each of them will differ in just a few subtle but powerful ways. Now. The purpose of this exercise is for you to fully experience the impact of this technique. I want you to say each of these phrases out loud, confidently, powerfully, and take on the confident physiology and sit up straight and say these phrases with an authoritative tone of voice. We will begin by thinking of a moment that's taking tomorrow off from work, or if it's a weekend as you read this, taking off an upcoming Monday. Notice that it's like motivation, your beliefs from whether or not you can do this will be influenced by how you say the words and the exercise to yourself. I want you to say to yourself, I can't take tomorrow off. And notice how you feel about taking the day off tomorrow. Can't is a model operator of impossibility in the present tense. Now say, I couldn't take tomorrow off. Notice how using model opera operator of impossibility closes off that option. Then say the following sentence, I can't take tomorrow off. As if you fully assume the confident physiology, say aloud, I couldn't take tomorrow off. While you do this, notice how it feels to you internally each time we exchange one of these model operators for the other. Feeling, the feeling will change. Next, say aloud, I could take tomorrow off. Using the could will alter the experience as if you find a saying it produces a different feeling. It might be compared to a contrast of the difference between feeling between all the sentences that you think about how one word can so drastically alter the meaning and feeling of the sentence. Could shifts your thinking from that the impossibility into thinking that something is possible, albeit with conditions attached. Well, to paraphrase the sentence, you could take tomorrow off and some condition were met. The conditional aspect is implied through the usage of the word could, as I explained earlier. Now, say the same sentence replacing could with can, and I can take tomorrow off. Your thinking has become shifted from possibility of taking tomorrow off if some condition were met to a very real possibility in your mind that you in fact can take tomorrow off if you choose to amplify this possibility next replace the model operator in the sentence with may say to yourself out loud I may take tomorrow off may pre-proposes that you may or may not take tomorrow off and implies that not only the fact that you can do something but it suggests that you are considering whether or not to do it where we've gone now to absolute impossibilities to serious consideration regarding taking the day off. Now use your next model operator. I should take the day off to tomorrow. Next say to yourself out loud, I shall take the day off tomorrow. This exercise has taken you from a conditional probability to almost certain. You're, full, you're finally making a commitment to yourself to take the day off tomorrow because you deserve it. After all, don't you? Next, tell yourself, I have to take the day off tomorrow, really says, like in your sanity depends on it, then notice how much more powerful the expression becomes, that I have to take tomorrow off. When you say, I have to take the day off tomorrow, you can feel it course through every part of your body. Next, say, 
I need to take the day off tomorrow. You need to. Taking the day off tomorrow has gone from a requirement to a necessity, a fundamental need. Notice how these differences increase your motivation that, that much more. Finally, use the model operator that you've seen here and you've been waiting for. I will take the day off till tomorrow. I will take the day off tomorrow. That says it authoritatively. That I will. I will. I will. Authoritatively and powerfully. Notice how committed you are in taking the day off till tomorrow. Look at how much your motivation has changed. You Just because you've changed the word on each continuum of motivation, you become from a place of... It was absolutely impossible to take the day off till tomorrow to becoming committed to taking off the day off tomorrow. This example demonstrates the power of these words and how people are using words to either limit themselves or model operators of impossibility to motivate themselves, the model operators of necessity, or to empower themselves with the more options of the model operators of possibility. Chapter 12, The Body Language of Confidence. If we are to have magical bodies, we must have magical minds. Dr. Wayne Dyer. Body language is just as important as verbal language. Your internal messages, images, sounds, emotions affect your physiology and vice versa. Confident body language versus shy body language. Quick lesson. Confidence and shy body language differ greatly and are rarely mistaken for each other. By realizing the difference, you can be assured to maintain confident body language as you build unstoppable confidence. Here's some examples of a shy body language. Hanging your head as if you're ashamed of yourself, slumping your shoulders forward, drooping your spine instead of standing up straight, looking down on the ground. Having a confident body language is just as easy to spot. It sends a much better message. Here's some examples of confident body language. Keeping your head held high, having your shoulders thrust back, keeping your abdominal muscles tucked in, standing up tall and proud. And if you don't feel confident in given, any given moment, you can project confidence through your words, gestures, and body language. Avoid wimping gestures. Some people resort to blaming, pla implicating in stressful situations rather than communicating their willingness to find a way out of the situation. They become panicked and are concerned with who's at fault. These people clearly lack the confidence. If they were able to alter their behaviors by maintaining a powerful, confident physiology, their internal states would match them on a calm, cool, collected, becoming a calm, cool, collected person. Maintaining composure is much more resourceful and effective for solving a problem than blaming or placating ever could be. Here are some methods for you on how to improve your body, how to move your body to stay confident. Never use placating gestures. Confidence, confident people never make placating gestures. These gestures convey that you are inferior, submitting to others, person. A classic placating gesture is when someone shrugs his shoulders with palms facing upward. If, as if you're pleading, I didn't do it, or this conveys a need to absolute oneself a responsibility of the situation. In order to have unstoppable confidence, you must avoid these gestures at all times. Another placating gesture is the shrug, which means someone doesn't really know what's happening, and perhaps even don't care. It does not make any sense to convey that you don't care about any situation ever. So if you don't know about something, simply admit as much as the matter-of-fact way. People lack confidence often to give an exaggerated response, announcing in an annoyed tone that they have no clue. A lot of times you can find an answer to a problem if you just stop for a moment and think about potential situations. Instead of giving up so easily and pleading ignorance, Henry Ford said, Thinking is the hardest activity there is to do. That is why so few many people engage in it. People who are confident may not necessarily have the answers, but... Yet they do know that they have all the resources to find the answer. When I ask someone a question and the immediate response is, I don't know, it indicates to me that this person is not even willing to make an educated guess to the initiative to finding out an answer. The better response when you genuinely do not know is to say, well, I'm not sure yet. Well, this indicates the truth about your uncertainty and proposes that you will probably be sure to sometime in the future indicate, indicated by that word yet. So never say, I don't know again. Just say, I don't know yet. Never use blaming gestures. The opposite of placating is blaming. Unstoppable confidence people will never do this. Blaming takes place when you're accusing someone else in your stead. This blaming frame of mind is very negative frame and it does not empower you at all. The classic gesture associated with blaming other people is pointing fingers or some other, or for some people to learn when they're young, when your point, finger pointer is aimed at someone else, that there are three other fingers actually pointing right back at you. Too many people blame, and it is not useful. Confident people come from a place of wanting to find solutions. 
They come from options and how to solve problems and create solutions. They move through the world calm, cool, unperturbed by outside events. They manage their emotions rather than letting their emotions manage them. You manage your emotions. Avoiding both blaming and placating gestures will help you and who you are, an unstoppably confident person who solves problems and gets the jobs, the job at hand done efficiently. Who and what caused the situation is irrelevant. The main idea is to solve it. You don't care who or what caused the situation. Your main idea is just to solve it and prevent it from occurring again in the future. Practice unstoppable body language. And if you want to feel like the most charismatic person around, project good thoughts outward, they will manifest themselves in your body language as well. Walk confidently. Confident people have a certain walk. When they enter a room, it seems as though they belong there, even as if they own the place. As you practice walking in confidently, remember that the situation is whatever you make it. Keep your head held high, your shoulders back, your tummy tucked in, and make a move and move through the world in deliberate steps. Feel free to walk at your own pace instead of adopting the speed everyone else is using. Avoid shuffling your feet, looking down at the ground. You'll notice a difference as you practice your confident body language and pay attention to the way you walk. Steeple your hands for confidence. Steepling is a gesture that conveys confidence by pressing your fingertips together while keeping your palms separate, touching each, each of the fingertips to the opposite hand. Many unstoppable, confident people steeple their hands to exude confidence. In fact, so many confident people do this gesture that's no, it's now associated with confidence. Get in the habit of steepling your hands when you want to convey confidence to others. The modern, the wonder of smiling. The wonder of smiling. If you want to have more confidence, all you have to do is smile. Practice smiling with anyone you see. Anywhere you go, do it when you're at work, home, or in the store. No matter where you are, give someone the gift of a smile. As you make it a habit, smile. Practice making a smile with small talk. You'll soon discover that your conversations will be flowing with greater ease than ever before. Ask how, ask how they are doing. Ask about their weekends. Find out how they, what they want in life. People love to talk about themselves and it feels good to really listen attentively to someone else. Even for me in the depths of my shyness, smiling was a very effective technique. Bringing a natural happy guy smiled often just because he was in a mood and the mood struck me. But when I discovered, what I discovered is, is that when I smiled at people, they would naturally smile back. And in fact, I'd make a game out of it. How many people could I get to smile sometimes when I... Sometimes when someone didn't respond to my smile, I approached, I kept broadening my smile until the person finally broke out of his or her stonic facial expression and smiled back. Smiling is disarming. It puts other people at ease. Since giving a smile is absolutely free and it always feels good to either give or receive, you should smile as often as possible. The Sound of Confidence Another key to confident communication is an excellent vocal tonality. Vocal tonality is the pitch from which you speak, and if your voice is nasal, for example, you'll be irritating and irritating other people. Certainly, it's not a good thing if your goal if is to project a confident image while communicating with them. You want a tonality that resonates within other people and causes them to feel good. Most people aren't even aware of it, but your vocal tonality has an effect on people in the unconscious level. Speaking with bad tonality, well, it's like running fingernails down a chalkboard. Personally, I'd rather listen to a dental drill than listen to someone drone on with nasal tonality. Tonality exercises. The good news is, is that people can improve their tonality through repeated practice. To exercise, you will need to place your hands on a certain body part and place your in attention while there while speaking. As a result, you will notice a shift in tonality. And by the end of the exercise, you'll have a deep, resonant tonality. Place your hands on your nose and say, this is my nose. The tonality should be nasal now and probably very irritating. Move your hands down to the mouth and now say, this is my mouth. And as you do this, listen for the difference in your tonality already. Next, place your hands on your throat and say, this is my throat. And you're changing the tonality yet. Place your hands in your upper chest and declare, this is my chest. And notice the tonality becoming more resonant. Finally, place your hands on your abdomen and say, this is my abdomen. And when I... And when I talk like this, I get a deep, rich tonality that people enjoy. When your attention goes and the energy flows, this is the reasons why your tonality gets better when you concentrate on your abdominal area. If you want to listen and model the tonality after someone, turn on the radio and really concentrate on how the disc jockeys use their voices. You'll never find a disc jockey with a nasal voice for reasons mentioned before. The look of confidence. Confident people are always able to look at others straight in the eye and tell it like it is. By looking someone in the eye, you will perceive as being more sincere, genuine, and honest. More sincere, genuine, and honest. 
no matter what you are saying, if you just look them in the eye, then if you are shifty-eyed or avoiding eye contact, people who lack confidence tend not to look others directly in the eyes. This elicits suspicion from the person from whom your non-confident person is interacting. Because most people, when they are telling the truth, look others directly in the eye. If you're not... If you have nothing to hide, focus your attention on looking people in the eye. You can even practice feeling good while doing it. Now, if you have a tendency right now to avoid eye contact, that's just fine. Call it a starting point. But after you do the following exercise, you'll discover how easily and naturally you could do it. And by the end of the exercise, you'll have informed the beginning of the habits. The difference between confident people and shy people, in summary, is that confident people have the habits that cause them to behave confidently. Conversely, shy people have the habits that cause them to act shy. Eye contact exercise. This exercise is designed to give you the ability to be present with someone and look that person straight in the eye, giving you more confidence. You'll be, you'll need a partner for this exercise. A great partner would be a supportive friend, spouse, or relative. Read through all the directions first and then begin. Read through all these directions first and then begin. By doing this exercise, you'll naturally find yourself breaking through the limits of your confidence, and it'll rise in an unprecedented level. Set an outcome for what you want to get out of this exercise. One good outcome is to be able to look people in the eye anytime. Tell them at every, any time that you choose and feel at ease while you're doing it. Get a timer that will let you know when five minutes is up. What you were going to do is sit across from your partner in a complete silence and be present with him or her. All you have to do is be silent. Look the person straight in the eye and beware. This is harder than it sounds. But as you do this exercise, you may have certain urges to laugh or look away. That only means that you now have an opportunity to break through the previous held limits. Stay with the exercise and continue looking your partner in the eye. Meanwhile, your partner will be doing the same with you. And if you do laugh or glance away, your partner should gently say, Stop. Be present. Start again. Similarly, if a partner laughs and glances away, give him or, him or her the same instruction. Continue on doing this for the entire five minutes. Having this skill means that you can confront any person to be there for him or her as a good listener. Your direct eye contact with another person means that you're neither superior nor inferior, but you are merely two equals communicating on a level ground. Do this exercise with your partner as many times as you can, and you'll need it in order to be able to look someone in the eye and pretty soon you'll discover that it is really really easy to do so with no longer to being intimidated to direct eye contact the real world is a true test of gauge now how you've come from of how far you've come after doing the exercise practice in the real world and notice how easy it is that you do it how surprised will you be when you find others doing it automatically others will react positively to your new confidence and this eye contact that you've learned is not designed to intimidate but foster better communication through honesty and openness. It will also let other people know that you have the look of confidence. Part 4. Becoming Unstoppable. Chapter 13. 21 Explosive Techniques to Supercharge Your Confidence. First comes thought, then organization of the thought into ideas and plans, then is transformation of those plans into reality. The beginning, as you will observe, is in your imagination. Napoleon Hill The techniques, exercises, and strategies in this chapter will speed you on your way to unstoppable confidence. Practice them regularly and watch your confidence soar. Technique 1 The Instant Shift One of the major steps in gaining more confidence is being aware when you're lacking confidence. The reason for this is that you have to be aware of something before you can change it. When you're aware that you're not being as confident, you can change it. It will no longer be a given that you're shy or tentative or whatever they label you previously used to describe yourself. As you become consciously of what your mental process is with respect to confidence, pay particularly attention to your internal voice. If you have a limiting negative voice nagging at you, I'm sure you naturally realize that you can stop your stop you dead in your tracks when you really want to go for it. Well, while you're paying attention to your internal voice, notice the sorts of images that are inside of your mind. When you hear and see internal impacts on how you feel, and the way you feel either frees you to take actions or hold you back. Now, when I was locked into my dungeon of shyness, any time I wanted to go out and meet a woman, I would project a big picture of a woman rejecting me and laughing at me before I even said hello. With these images in my head, I was completely paralyzed with the fear and took no action. Instead, I watched an opportunity pass me by, and I regretted it every time. If you want excellent feelings, you have to see and hear excellent things, which is easy because you're in control of your own mental processes. Whenever you're acting shy, you must simply stop and realize that this is a process and that you can change it. 
And if you find yourself acting in a tentative way or shy way, here are some NLP techniques that you could try. Interrupt the process. Imagine a police officer springing up inside of your mind, holding a red stop sign. Imagine that he shouts out with an authoritative tone and loud, as loud as he can, and says, Stop! When you hold these images in your mind, you'll find yourself immediately stopping the processes of feeling that lack of confidence. Shift your state, and once you stop the process, you can change your directions and go in any direction you want. For purposes that you should immediately shift your physical state to one that exudes confidence. Employ excellent physiology and posture. Head up, shoulder back, stomach tucked in. Put your smile on your face. Feel good just like that. And if your body is in this state of confidence, it's easy for your mentality and for you to mentally follow suit. The instant shift. Number one, recognize your shy or unconfident action. And number two, interrupt the process. Number three, shift your physical state to a confident posture. And then four, let your mind follow suit. Technique two, rehearse confidence. Once you interrupt a negative mental process, you could then consciously choose your emotional state you want to experience. You won't be merely acting out the habit, you'll be acting out a conscious choice that is very powerful. And with this technique, you can program yourself to have unstoppable confidence whenever you need it. The key is that when you rehearse what you get, you the key is that what you rehearse is, is what you get. A friend of mine who was into martial arts always reminded me that train the way you fight because you will fight the way you train. This holds true for being confident as well, and by rehearsing confidence in your mind, you will have it when you need it. For you to have unstoppable confidence, you need to mentally rehearse it in your presence. This means that you're going to have to visualize what you desire. Confidence. We will watch ourselves walking, talking, moving confidently. We will see ourselves doing things that never before have been done, not even and realize that were possible. If it's difficult to do this at first, don't worry. Visualizing is a skill like any other, and you will need to get better at it with practice. If you think that you have difficulty visualizing, pretend that it's easy for you. You have a way of dealing with anything one way to dealing with anything to fake it until you make it pretend that you can visualize as you do that you will develop such such a skill in visualize in visualizing that pretty soon you'll forget that you were just pretending and you'll soon be a great visualizer now now that you're visualizing, focus on the image of yourself behaving confidently. As projected on your mental movie screen, notice how you exude confidence in every fiber of your being. Now others can sense it coming from you. As you can see yourself behaving confidently, listen to what you hear as you fulfill your experience, that ultimate state of confidence within. To amplify your confidence state, make the picture bigger, brighter, closer. Crank that sound way up in your state of mind so that you can feel that confidence coursing through your entire being. Let the past resonate all throughout your body. Let the bass resonate. When you make these adjustments to your experience, notice how much powerful and confident you become. Do this exercise as many as you, times as it takes to thoroughly feel the confidence inside of you. How will you know when you've done it right? The answer is that by looking at the mental images of your confident self, you'll automatically feel the confidence. This is how you know that you're successfully completing this exercise. Your unconscious mind does not understand the difference between a scenario that is genuinely real and a scenario that is vividly imagined. For that reason, vividly imagining confidence is your future means that you are literally programming yourself to have the confidence when you need it. Set a trigger for confidence that you've rehearsed. Here's how to set yourself up for confidence anytime. Number one, close your eyes. Number two, watch yourself on a mental movie big screen as confident. Number three, enhance your visual and sound qualities of the movie. Number four, jump into your own on-screen body and let's see through your own eyes and hear what you hear and feel total confidence. Number five, hold your thumb and your first finger together as you experience confidence. The more you feel confident, the harder you press your thumb and first finger together. After five seconds, separate your thumb and first finger and open your eyes. Repeat the first step. Re repeat the first seven steps, but watch a different confidence scenario. By doing this, you'll have programmed your mind to respond to a feeling of your thumb and forefinger pressed together as a confidence trigger. Confidence trigger. Now that you've rehearsed it, whether you need confidence or not, you can just close your eyes and press your thumb and forefinger together as long enough to let you have starting a feeling that you've triggered and it starts flooding through you. Rehearsing confidence. Focus on an image of acting confident as on a movie screen. Listen to yourself speaking confidently. View the picture in a close up, turning up the volume. Feel the confidence as you project it on screen. Technique three, program confidence. 
You and I have all the resources that we'll ever need to become total, successful, unstoppably confident. Many people discount how resourceful they could potentially be to have unstoppable confidence in the future. The key is to be able to summon your own confidence resources that will get you the results that you want. You did it successfully in the past, which means you can do it successfully anytime. It's only a matter of practice before you have the confidence whether you choose to switch it on. Remember the time that you were unstoppably confident in the past. Become aware of what specifically you did see, hear, feel inside as you re-experience what it's like to complete completely be confident. There's a structure to your confidence experience in the same way that there's a structure to your building. There's certain qualities that you see, hear, feel, and building this specific to that building. Similarly, this is a certain thing that you see, hear, and feel only when you are in a confident state. While you relieve a past, while you relive a past time when you were confident, ask yourself the following questions. To become aware of the visual qualities of confidence, what size is what you see? What size is what you see? Do you see a picture or a movie? Is it three-dimensional? How clear or fuzzy is it? How bright is it? How close is it? Is it in color or is it in black and white? Now, as you ask yourself the following questions to become aware of the auditory qualities of confidence that confidence has for you, ask yourself, what do you hear? How loud is it? What's the tempo? What's the pitch? What direction does the sound come from? And ask yourself the following questions to become aware of the sensory qualities of confidence. Where does the feeling begin in my body? How intense is the feeling? What direction does the feeling come from? And how long does this feeling last? By altering the visual, auditory, and sensory qualities of confidence, you can actually amplify your confident state. Practice playing around in all of these different qualities. See the appendix for more qualities. And notice the results and the effects of your confident state. This means that you can build even more confident state once you find the qualities that work best for you. As you relive your past confidence and relive your past confidence experiences, become aware of the visual, auditory, sensory qualities associated with the experience. Realize that you can use these same qualities to program yourself in an unlimited limited confidence in your future. The way you do this is by imagining situations in the future where you will need unstoppable confidence and imagining your future confident self adjusting from what you see, hear, feel to match your past experiences of confidence. You are literally programming your mind to have unstoppable confidence in the future. When the moment arrives, you will mind, your mind will act as if you already experienced it before and give you the unlimited confidence. Any subject or event coming in your future, start thinking completely confident about it and when the event comes, you'll already be confident about it. As I've said, the mind does not make distinction between what is real and what is vividly imagined. Real time scans the brain to reveal whether you take a physical action or simply vividly imagine doing it. The same areas of your brain are activated. You can take advantage of this by programming your mind in advance. Program confidence. Number one, relive the past experience in which you felt confident and noticed all visual, audi auditory, and sensory qualities associated with that experience. Now imagine a situation in the future where you'll need that type of confidence and imagine yourself adjusting to what you see, hear, and feel to match the past experience of confidence. Technique four, anchoring. Many who have studied psychology will be aware of the groundbreaking experiments conducted by the animal behaviorist Ivan Pavlov that determine the power of stimulus response conditioning. After noticing that a dog salivates when they eat, he, pre he paled a unique stimulus, the shining of a light with the presentation of the dog's meal. Pavlov would turn on the light immediately before giving the dog food. After several rounds of this, the dog would salivate even when the light was just turned on but no food was present. Prior to this pairing, shining the light had no effect on the dog's salivation, salivation, but after the stimulus, the light had been paired with the response, salivation, the dog would reliably salivate when the light was shone. The phenomenon of stimulus response conditioning has come to be known as many circles as anchoring. An anchor is a stimulus that triggers a mental state. An anchoring is an anchor is a stimulus that triggers a mental state. It has been applied to a phobia treatment, motivation, and other areas of personal development. The beauty of anchoring is that it can be very easy to do for yourself. Properties of good anchors are that they elicit a strong emotional state, they must be unique, and they must be repeatable. Now, if it's all very well to work for yourself into an unstoppably confident state manually when you have the time, but what about when you'd like to get into that state instantly? 
Well, this is anchoring and where anchoring comes from. When you want to get yourself into a state of being confident, motivated, and strong, you can easily pair the state of stimulus of your own. Many people like to use music. If you want to do this, pick a piece of music that matches and maybe even evokes the state that you want to anchor, such as the Eye of the Tiger or the Chariots of the Fire theme. Pick one of your favorite confidence techniques and do it along with the music. Do this over and over again and you'll find that listening to the music immediately plunges you into that state. You can even anchor states with internal stimuli. Any imagine, any image that automatically puts you into a certain state already in, already in an anchor. For some people, just thinking about the smiling face of their spouse puts them in a romantic state. Just thinking about a happy baby is enough to make many people melt with a tenderness. All of these mental techniques is designed for tapping into a natural power to activate an emotional circuitry of your brain and body to produce a confident state. Once you have that state, you can pair it with an outside stimuli like music or pictures, or you can associate it with internal stimuli like remembering images, sounds, or feelings. The following is a great internal anchor of mine, and I want to pass it on. After you imagine a few times, you'll naturally associate what you see and hear inside of your mind with a powerfully confident state. Picture a jet black puma at the top of a glorious canyon spans miles across. Puma radiates intensity with its black is arched and its poised pounce and its unsuspectedly prey below. The prey does not even realize what will transpire as the puma knowingly licks up its sharp teeth. But as you watch the scene, if you will, step into the puma's body and become the puma. See with the puma's eyes. Hear what the puma hears. Feel the unstoppable confidence state that the puma has as you become completely aware of just how easily you are going to devour your prey, accomplish your goal, or devour your prey, or accomplish your goal. To even more fully experience this confidence state, let loose with a growl that will rival any puma, puma, puma alive. Doing this will help you associate this powerful state with the sound of a growl. After doing this exercise, you'll be able to simply growl internally and immediately go back to this state of unstoppable confidence. All you'll ever need to do to get this, again, is to stop for a moment, close your eyes, and growl inside of your mind and become the puma. Anchoring. Practice a favorite, practice a favorite confident generating exercise. While doing so, listen to the piece of music that makes you feel confident or an image uh, imagine an image that makes you feel good about yourself. Well, when you want to recreate a confident feeling internally, hear the music or see that image. Technique 5. Circle of Confidence. The next technique is advanced from the anchoring called the Circle of Confidence. Circle of Confidence. Instead of anchoring something on location to your body or internal stimuli, this technique anchors confidence to a spot on the ground. And to doing so, you will physically step into an unstoppable confidence whenever you need it. There have been times in your past when you were confident in the future when you were confident in the future you'll begin you will be confident again the key is to be able to summon that feeling at will this technique allows you to evoke a state of confidence wherever and whenever you want to form your circle of confidence imagine a circular location on the floor before you step into that circle, notice its exact dimensions. Picture it either with colors or transparent, and if, as if you will. When you physically step into that circle, you will move back in time to a moment which you had complete confidence. Pick up an experiment. Pick an experience of an ultimate confidence. While you're standing in your circle, fully relive the instance and confidence. See what you saw at that time. Hear what you hear. Allow yourself to feel unstoppably confident of that experience. Inside the circle, feeling confident, adjust your body language. Match your confidence state. Keep the confidence state as you walk around outside the circle. Now, if you have enough confidence to meet your outcome, you are done with this exercise. If you need more, go back into that circle and relive the difference. Equally powerful, confident experience. Continue stacking up this confidence until you have all that you need. Regardless of whether, whenever, wherever you are, you can use a circle of confidence as just a confidence technique or a confidence builder to instantly gain more confidence, exaggerating your strongness, your powerful physiology, as you train your body how to stand and move. And pretty soon, you'll find yourself naturally standing confident as a habit circle of confidence. Imagine a circle on the ground remembering the situation in which you felt confident. Relieve the experience as you step into the circle. Relive that experience of confidence as you step into that circle and adopt that confident posture. Step outside the circle and continue to walk and act confidently. Technique 6. Mirror Affirmations. Typically when people do affirmations they repeat them endlessly in hopes that they will not work. 
Doing so is somewhat effective, but it can be made such more effective when someone simply has a modification to it. This technique can supercharge the efficiency of the affirmations. Instead of using statements like beginning with I, you will use statements beginning with you. These situations are more powerful because they allow you to consciously mind to tell you, your conscious mind, specifically what you want and how to behave. Get in front of a mirror and stand in front of the mirror with a confident physiology and project your intention for these affirmations to change your life. The larger the mirror, the bigger it is, the better, because you can see more of yourself. With your shoulders back, your head held high, and your stomach tucked in, look yourself squarely in the eye and say, with the following affirmations, you are completely powerful. You are unstoppably confident. You will become more and more confident each and every day. Nothing can stop you. You can go for what you want and get it. Repeat these affirmations to yourself in the mirror until you totally feel them in your body. Perhaps you could see yourself a bit differently when you do it, as you will already notice behaving differently and more confident. Or maybe you'll hear the inner voice speaking forcefully with absolute confidence from within. Do this daily as part of your confidence building regimen, and I can guarantee you that you'll have an unstoppable confidence in, no, in a little bit of time. Mirror affirmations as you stand in front of the mirror, adopt a confident physiology, shoulders back, head up, stomach tucked in. Deliver affirmations to yourself in the mirror using you instead of I. You. Technique 7. Future success now. I have future success now, and if you were to taste the future success, how would it feel? What would it look like to achieve your goals now? Wouldn't it feel tremendously more motivating to go for it right now? This future success now technique does exactly that. It brings all the future feelings of success into your heart, mind, and soul right now. You can experience such an overwhelming sense of success, and you'll surrender to your passion and go for it. Any fear that might have had still in the present, but you desire for success, dominating all other emotions, you'll feel the need to take action and fulfill your goals. In this exercise, the outcome you will want is to set to increase your confidence. This means saying, either aloud or in your mind, I'm doing this exercise to increase my confidence and feel more passion, which will naturally cause me to go after my goals and make my dreams more reality. Are you already, are you ready to feel your future success? Close your eyes. Picture your mental movie screen. See yourself at the point from which you're about to reach that pinnacle of your success while you're watching yourself. Make sure that you see yourself in color, big, bright, close up in a picture in HD, crisp and clear right in front of your face. Fill your mind with stereo surrounded sounds. Turn up the volume all the way. Just before you reach your pivotal point from where all your success is yours, stop the movie you're watching and ask yourself some questions to clarify exactly what you're going after for this success. Exactly, you are going to find out and clarify why exactly you're going after this success. What's important into getting this pleasure? What's important about that? Ultimately, what does going, what does having the success do for you? Now we start the movie and witness yourself achieving your goal and getting all the massive, all the massive success and pleasure that you deserve that comes with it. Right as you see yourself on the mental screening, fulfilling your goals and experiencing the wonderful feeling of victory, jump into your on-screen body. Now, through your own eyes, as if you could see there, because your eyes, now through your own eyes, as if you are there now because your mind you are hear the sounds of success feel the success like in every fiber of your being as the moment comes to a climax I want you to take all these wonderful feelings and wrap them up take those unlimited feelings that you have and jump out of that mental screen back into your physical body allowing all those magnificent feelings to ebb and flow you've just smelt the sweet scent of your future success you've tasted the victory you've realized the glory of yours to be for the taking it's up to you to take action now and claim your right what's rightfully yours as you complete this exercise write down five immediate actions that you will take to bring you one step closer to achieving that success that you deserve a future a future success now number one only your mental screen play a movie on your mental screen play a movie of you succeeding massively just at the point you are about to get the peak of your success in a movie temporarily hit pause ask yourself what's important about the success and what will having the success do jump into the movie as you begin playing it again and soak up the unlimited massive success that you deserve when the movie is done take all these wonderful feelings back with you as you open your eyes write down five immediate actions that you will take that you will begin want to get you one step closer to achieving your goals. Technique 8. Put your life in perspective right now. Consider whatever appears overwhelming to you now. By the end of this exercise, you'll think about it completely different and one with much more confidence about what you're going to do. 
Picture a line representing your lifetime. The past is off to the left and the present is in the center and your future is off to the right. Now, place whatever is bothering you on this timeline and visualize it as a small dot in your mind. Take a step back so you can see a larger portion of your entire timeline instead of just the present. present. Notice how this puts you in a minor new instance into a different perspective. Now mentally step back even further and notice all of your past and all of your future at once. And recognize just how small and insignificant this dot represents your current problem. When you keep things in perspective, you're really difficult to waste. When you keep things in perspective, it's really difficult to waste valuable time and energy on trivial things. The trouble begins when people do not keep their big picture in sight and magnify some issues to be larger than it really is. So put your life in perspective by number one, visualize your life as a timeline, picture whatever is overwhelming you as a point on that timeline, and then mentally step back to see that dot in perspective as something tiny and small. Chapter 9. Avoid the future that you don't want. Well, as we saw earlier, people are motivated either by moving towards pleasure or by moving away from pain. Well, if you were bunny rabbits, it would be equivalent as us as moving towards carrots or away from people's boots. The next technique will work best for people who run away from the boots, so to speak, because it amplifies the pain of not going after your dreams to the point from where it'll seem easier just to do it. To do this exercise, visualize a timeline from Technique 8. Close your eyes and imagine floating above the timeline, drifting forward far into the future. Continue floating forward until you get to the point from where you were older and most of your opportunities have passed you by. And as you get the point, you'll see yourself in a mental movie, screen, walking around, feeling miserable. Doing this, you might realize that you are looking at a person who has lived a life unfulfilled. Turn into the sounds coming of the older person who have made much had who had so much potential yet somehow failed to take action and live his or her dreams. Just the feeling as it disappoints rises to an extreme where your future self appears to realize that his or her life has not been invested wisely. Jump right into that older person's body and see the experience and what it's like. Feel how awful it is to lead a life unfulfilled. It is really quite tragic, isn't it? When you fully experience that feeling of deep regret, all the pain, disappointment, frustration that you will if you don't go after your dreams, immediately take action. Jump back into your physical body, and if you don't take action now, then go to go after your dreams, then that's how you will feel. If you don't take action now to go after your dreams, then that's how you will feel when you get older. Now, since you've experienced the pain that will happen if you don't go after your dreams right now, you are aware of how much you are motivated and you are to avoid the feelings that the feeling that you cannot live your dreams now if you hesitate in your future call that a horrible feeling from the experience that allows you to propel you to take action to break out of this negative state of mind induced by the exercises use one of the previous visualization techniques visualization techniques to see a wonderful future that you will have when you use your confidence resources to get the future that you want so again, avoid the future you don't want. Visualize a timeline with Technique 8. See yourself further down the timeline with most of your opportunities passed over. Imagine your response physically, audibly, emotionally as an unfulfilled life. Come back to your present self. Summon those feelings of disappointment and rage when you need to get motivated and get busy. Technique 10. Build an enriched past. Oftentimes, a lack of confidence when facing a new experience stems from not having done it before in order to get good on doing something. Usually you have to do it poorly at first. And when, and when this happens, some people equate that poor performance with failure or becoming anxious and understand that we don't have to do everything perfectly from the start. Having said that, though, how much more confident would you feel if you knew that you had done something many times before? I'm willing to bet you that you would be tremendously more confident. This next technique builds memories from the past that feature you succeeding wildly at whatever you are about to do. You may or may not have heard of false memory syndrome. False memory syndrome occurs when someone gets something else to create memories of events that didn't really happen. However, the false memories are so vividly imagined that they seem so real to the person to whom they are implanted and consequently the person acts as if they are. In situations like this, and the memories of usually disempowered, what if we were to create false memories in ourselves, having massive success that we really are about to do for the first time? How about 
How much confidence will we have when we do this? Build into the past as many successes as you can find necessary, and you will have done this by visualizing success, which you've done, and imagine happening to the past as you create your past successes. Really intensify the experience so that you can catch the feeling and confidence that you've needed. When I was starting out in my public speaking, I had no experience at all, but since I needed to rapidly gain experience to be credible, I went back into my past and created an entire series of memories, even though I consciously knew that they were all false memories. They were also vividly imagined that I, my unconscious mind I knew no difference, and which consequently allowed me to behave as if I've already been speaking a lot. And I imagined that I had an entire history of making wonderful speeches, motivating audiences, and receiving standing ovations for my abilities. To go one step further, I imagined people taking my message to heart, acting on it, transforming their lives. By creating all these memories, by the time I got up to actually speak for the first time, I was delightfully simple. I radiated confidence from the beginning, and anyone can use these techniques to better himself or herself. It's just a matter of knowing the techniques and applying them in your life. To build an enriched past, number one, see yourself in your past on your mental movie screen, massively succeeding at whatever you've actually what you actually are about to do for the first time. Crank up the visual and sound qualities to make the new memory really intense. Do this 10 times to create 10 different positions, memories of your successes. Technique 11. The technique goes back into a past of implants, new memories into similar fashions to exercise the technique 10. Only this time, instead of giving yourself a history that will be rewriting your history, go back to the time from when you really blew it. Perhaps something you were expected to accomplish was not smashing success that you intended it to be. Close your eyes and watch yourself on a mental movie screen as you just about to make the mistake or screw things up. Just prior to the instant in the time from which you're about to start deviating from the success path, start making mistakes or stop the, stop the movie. We stop the movie now because we don't want to rehearse the negative incident, but we only want to reinforce it in a way of behaving. While the movie is stopped, think about how the situation ideally would have turned out if you could give it an ending. Well, we start the movie and replace the old ending with an ideal ending. See? See, hear, and feel something succeeding in the way you deserve. After you've watched the movie from the start, finish the third person point of view. Just jump into the on-screen body and run the movie from start to finish with a new ideal ending. As you see, hear, and feel the massive success, that's yours. Now, run the entire movie from start to finish ten times. This will recode the past incident as the success in your mind. Furthermore, rehearsing and reinforcing success teaches your mind to create success in the future. As you look back on your past, you'll notice things are different. The way you look at all the fails are actually bridges to the success. Your past has been enriched now. You can enrich your past, and you'll discover yourself moving through the world more resourcefully. One thing about the technique is that it's versatility. You can correct any part of your past in whatever way you want. Correct past mistakes. The technique of correcting past mistakes, number one. Watch yourself in the past on your mental movie screen. Write up the point before, which before you made the mistake, and at that point, stop the movie. And think about what the ideal ending would be, and then finish the movie with the ideal solution. you have behaving resourcefully and getting your outcome. Run the movie from start to finish with the new ending, feeling that it's like, feeling what it's like to get your outcome. Now jump into your on-screen body and run the movie on the success ten times and lock it in. Technique 12, the domino effect. As you recall from earlier in this book, beliefs come in two different forms, casualty and meaning. Again, as you recall from earlier in this book, beliefs, beliefs come from two different forms, casualty and meaning. X causes Y or Y means or X means Y. Again, X causes and Y X causes Y or X means Y. Causes or it means. Understanding how beliefs are structured means that we can consciously choose those beliefs that are empowering to us. For example, if someone believes public speaking means it's time to be fearful and lack confidence, then obviously this belief will be made manifest in that person's behavior. As he or she gets nervous before making a speech, it's nece necessary to understand how beliefs are formed. To use this next technique, Think of something that is so far outside of your comfort zone that you would be absolutely amazed, surprised, and delighted if you actually did it. In thinking about this, keep in mind that it should be something that is feasible, something you could immediately do, and should make this decision to take action. Become aware, become aware of the specific...
of what specifically you would see, hear, and feel when doing it. Now, just ponder what sort of confidence it would take for you to do this shining that you, and to do this thing that you are so afraid of. Once you've thought of something completely outside of your comfort zone, you will naturally realize that if you were actually to do this, you could do anything you wanted in the world. After all, if you could step out that far out of your comfort zone, you could continue to expand even further outside of it, can't you? To make this exercise really work, lock in a belief that doing whatever it is that you were thinking of right now, that you are afraid to do so, means that you could do anything. I chose the skydive as my activity for this exercise. I can lead a pretty conservative lifestyle, keeping risks a bare minimum, and so I had never done anything so daring before. Some risks, I soon learned, are worth it. To gain more confidence in myself, I built in this belief that as I jump out of an airplane and hurtle to the ground in rapid speeds, I'll be stepping far outside of my comfort zone, and by proving to myself that I could do things I wasn't quite sure of I, that I could do, means that I could do anything in the world. For me, skydiving demonstrates that anything is possible for me. When you do this in your activity, you'll realize that anything is possible for you. Your example can be whatever you want it to be, and as long as it is a big stretch outside of your comfort zone. It could be marching into your boss's office and asking for a raise, speaking publicly, running marathon. The most important part is that when making it happen, you will realize that anything is possible for you when you set your mind to it. When you've decided on what you're going to do, take immediate action to ensure that that's what will happen. Get things in motion so that you can, taking immediate action to starting your excellent habits to develop. Taking immediate action is an excellent habit to develop. Taking immediate action. I take immediate action. Take immediate action. The most successful, unstoppably confident people take immediate action and accordingly to manifest their dreams sooner. To anyone who is very logical or critically oriented, the belief that since I can skydive, I can do anything is not very logical at all. Yet beholding the belief that you could do anything will enable you to go for much, much more than those who have limited themselves with logic. You may not be able to do anything, but you'll definitely go past your old limits. And remember, what seems like a limit is very often just a limit in belief, not in reality. So when you choose that your beliefs choose to become, choose them become because they are useful and empowering, not based on so-called logic. Choose your beliefs because they will help you live your dreams. The domino effect is number one, choose an activity that is far outside of your comfort zone. And number two, realize that in doing this activity, it makes it possible to do anything that you choose to do. Follow through with this activity as quickly as possible and hold on to the new belief that you can make anything happen. Technique 13. Technique 13, borrow confidence. A great way to gain confidence is to model yourself after someone else who has already had a lot of confidence. Anyone who has an absolute belief in himself or herself will make a good model for you. One way to supercharge your results is using the techniques to repeat it, using several different people as your models of unstoppable confidence. Once you've identified the person who embodies confidence to you, get to know and thoroughly get to know as thoroughly as possible this person as it moves through the as this moves through the world. To do this, spend as much time as you can with that person and talk about his or her opinions of confidence, life, taking action. If your model of confidence is not accessible to you, perhaps you can get to know the person and very variciously by purchasing his or her books or CDs or home study courses or by attending a seminar. If it's a rock star that you could go, you could go to his or her concert. If it's a star athlete, perhaps you can attend his or her sporting event. The ideal, the idea here is to expose your mind to this person so much as possible that you get a better grasp on how to model your beliefs, attitudes, and values. The more effectively you can model his or her confidence, the better you can model his or her confidence. Set a strong outcome for this exercise, such as, I want a confidence like, and then name the model of the confidence. For these reasons, and then list the reasons. By the time you reach the point, you have already familiarized yourself with the model of confidence, and you have a good grasp on his or her perceptions of the world, the self, and what he or she does. Close your eyes and envision your model of confidence behaving in an unstoppably confident way in a movie, in your mental screen. Pay attention to how the person speaks, moves, gestures, and walks. Become aware of how this person interacts with others. Imagine, imagine his or hers internal self-talk. 
and noticed anything else that you can about this person. Make the movie big, bright, and close, HD, digital, crisp. Turn the sound up all the way that you can and resonate it inside of you. Next, step into the movie. As you are stepping into the confidence model's body, take on this person's entire being as though you're seeing through their eyes and your confidence models through their eyes. Hear with, hear his or her ears and feel what it's like to completely immerse yourself and be unstoppably confident as this person. Now, as you are inside this confident model's shoes, physically do all you can to be like this person. Just do speaking, move, use the facial expressions your model does. Continue doing this until you fully understand what it feels like to make your models unstoppably confident. To make your models unstoppable, to have your model as unstoppable and confident. If it helps, imagine yourself as this person in different contexts. When you fully have that feeling down, you'll see yourself stepping out of your own person's body and back into yours. And as you float back into your own body, take with you that unstoppably confident feeling that you've just created. Integrate that feeling into your body, your mind, and your identity. By having your model's confidence once, you can have it any time and want any time you want simply by just doing the exercise. Remember to borrow confidence. Number one. Find someone who's confident that you'd like to have for yourself, who's confident you'd like to have for yourself. Expose yourself to that model of confidence as much as possible. Watch your role model behaving confidently as your mental movie screen. Notice how this person moves through the world, how he or she speaks and gestures make you imagine really compelling by turning into a visual auditory sensory quality. Step into the movie and become that model. Gesture, speak and move through the world as this person does with their unstoppable confidence. Then step into a model in five different contexts. When you feel that you have to handle this person's confidence, the handle of their confidence, step back into the model's step back out step outside of the model's body and take his or her confidence back with you. Technique 14. Schedule your schedule your dreams. Successful people plan their work and then they work their plan. This technique will help you decide on what you want and focus your energy towards pursuing it. Goals are dreams with deadlines. For that reason, this technique gives you some specific deadlines for achieving your dreams. What I want you to do is imagine yourself five years in the future, living your ideal lifestyle with the sort of job. What sort of job would you have? What have you accomplished? What do you, where do you live? What is your lifestyle like? Focus on the answers to these questions, and once you have the answers, build what you call an expanded resume. A typical resume charts for what you have accomplished and the skills that you possess now. An expanded resume it encompasses your entire life, your family life, your career, your social circle, your spirituality, your finances, and so on. Creative and expanded resumes, what will be true for you in five years? Reread this resume once a week and more often. If you can invest the time, and in five years in time, you will have accomplished much, if not all, of what you put down. A similar technique for channeling your energy into a direction is you want is to construct a future magazine cover with yourself on it. The magazine could either be real or fictitious, but it should show us succeeding in whatever area of your life that you choose. When I did this, I used a computer presentation software to import my pho photograph and design into a magazine cover and inserted catchy headlines and prescribed what I would achieve. When this cover was finished, I printed it out and proudly displayed it on my desk. From time to time, I would glance over at it and find it there, and I automatically became more motivated to take action and move towards my goals. Schedule your dreams. Number one, scheduling your dreams, the expanded resume. Number one, imagine where you would like to be in five years from now. Write down the details, family, work, leisure time, friends, and so on, and review this expanded resume at least once a week. Your future magazine cover. Well, create a real imagining magazine cover for yourself succeeding in some area of your life and use catchy headlines, images, and describe what you want to achieve. Review your magazine cover periodically to keep, the motiva keep you motivated in reaching your goals. Technique 15. Swish into confidence. The next technique is called the swish technique because, because in it, you redirect your brain as rapidly as a basketball makes the swish sound when it flies through the net. Our mind is trained to go into a certain direction. Sometimes if we have not consciously directed our minds, we tend to gravitate towards less than resourceful behaviors, such as shyness. The technique redirects the brain in the effect telling it, not shy, confident. If you act shy, you do not. You do it out of a pattern that you've either consciously or unconsciously set up for yourself, and there are triggers that you cue to your brain that the shyness pattern. What we're going to do is take those same triggers, reframe, and retrain your mind so that when you spur towards a confidence, you'll spur towards confidence instead. Think of the times when you act shy. 
the side on the initial queue that lets you know that it's time to get nervous and tentative. And for some people, arriving in a party full of strangers is looking at an unfamiliar face in a queue to begin acting shy. For others, seeing an attractive member of the opposite sex sit down nearby, sitting down nearby might set them off. Find out what your cue is. People do not randomly become shy. There's always a cue that precedes it. Now, now that you've discovered the cue that has led you to shyness in the past, put yourself into the picture of experience in, in from a first-person perspective. Practice making the picture of what you see smaller, darker, and farther away. Take the normal picture of the cue image and make it small, dark, and really so far away in a way that in the time it takes for you to say out loud, swish. Do this unless you feel that you can take the picture of your shyness cue and make it disappear in an instant. Any issues, make it smaller, farther away. Do it before you can say the word swish. Following that picture, an image of your ideal self, don't jump into the image yet. Picture yourself on how you'd want to behave instead of how you currently do. See those strong, confident gestures, facial expressions, and postures, and make sure that when you think about your ideal self, you feel really motivated to be that way. If you don't feel a strong sense of motivation, then adjust your image of your ideal self until you do. Make this picture small, dark, and far away at first, and then practice making this picture really big, bright, close up, rapidly as you can, as fast as you can say, swish. Practice the exercise until you can do it easily. Now. What we're going to do is redirect the mind so that whatever it's experiencing, the cue, the cue image it, it will automatically flash to your ideal self and therefore draw you into being coming to being that person. When you've done this successfully, you will see the trigger that used to make you shy and immediately experience an unconscious shift in confidence. Close your eyes and see what cue image in the forefront of your mind. See it big, bright, close up, HD, crystal clear. Just see, just like you would if you were experiencing it for real in the lower right corner of your vision see your ideal self image smaller darker farther away make the swish sound and simultaneously flip the two pictures so that you cue the image becomes small dark far away an ideal self image becomes really big bright and close remember to make the swish sound as you do this exercise because it will help you unconsciously move the pictures around swish Pause for a moment, open your eyes, and then reset your pictures so that you see the cue image big and close and your confident self in lower right corner. Then you can make the swish sound and it toggles the screens. So you transpose them in the same way you did previously. To continue to repeat this pursuing, resetting, and swishing of pictures until simply looking at the cue image automatically triggers your brain to gravitate towards the ideal self image. That's how, that's how you know that you've been successful in retraining your mind. Swish into confidence. Number one, identify the cue that's triggering your shyness. Number two, practice making the image of that cue smaller, darker, farther away until you can't, until you can do it in the time it takes for you to say swish. Now picture the idealized self smaller, darker, and smaller away. Now picture your idealized self smaller, darker, and farther away. Practice making that idealized self bright and close up again in the time it takes you to say swish. Finally, practice transposing the two pictures as if they sound of the word swish in your brain makes the shyness trigger from small and far away while bringing your idolized self to the forefront. Now however you're feeling, screen it, swish. Now you're in the other image. Technique 16. Disassociate. Add resources. Act differently. Sometimes people feel overwhelmed by situations because they're too deeply invested in them. If someone's too close to a situation, they may be difficult for him or her to reason logically about it. For example, if you have to make a major decision and there's an overriding emotional component, that emotional component may skew your judgment. This technique helps you stand back and survey the bigger picture then in order to make the best decision for yourself. What is the smartest decision that you can make in any given second, moment, nanosecond? The smartest decision you can ever make. What will it do? What will do? What you will do in this technique is to observe yourself in a third person point of view. You will step outside of your body and look over at yourself, making a decision. Pick yourself on the mental movie screen, but don't jump into it yet. Just look at your on body screen. You are a detached observer. Pretend that you are the narrator and you refer to yourself into this as third person by repeating, repeatedly using your name. Well, as Randy currently walks over here, and then Randy went this way, and think through the decisions making processes out loud and detach the frame of mind. As you narrate your thinking process regarding to the decision, you should be sure you have confident physiology and tonality. This will help you make a firm commitment to the decision from which you are ultimately going to arrive at. As a result, your decisions will be more rational, emotionally literally giving yourself some distance from the situation. 
Another way to perform this technique is with the confidence resource triangle. Describe next. The confidence resource triangle. It's a confidence resource triangle. The main difference is that the triangle uses physical locations to represent the different states. The confidence resource triangle has three legs. Stuck state. Location a disassociated observer location and a resource location again they have three legs a stuck state location a disassociated observer location and a resource location the stuck state is the state where a person will ex experience indecision and need a resource the disassociated location is where a person can stand back and objectively look at the situation from a third person point of view the resource location represents a resource that will get a person unstuck from his or her indecisive state. Find three different spots on the floor and label one S for stuck, one D for disassociated, and one R for resource. First step onto the S location. Close your eyes if it helps you. See, hear, and feel the little element of the context where you need more confidence. Just when you're getting a taste of it, step outside of the location. Name three different things in the room to break your state. Thus get you out of that state of stuck second step onto the D location and look at the same situation as you did in S location but do it with a third person perspective now how different is it that you can perceive things more objectively think of confident resources that will help you conquer this stuck state third step onto the R location and as you do this physical step you will mentally step into a resource by completely reliving a past time when you were confident see when you saw heard and hear and felt what it's like remember what it's like and crank it up crank up that confidence level now with overwhelming confidence at your disposal step back into what used to be the stuck state how easily naturally you do not get unstuck now with all this confidence oozing from every fiber of your being if for some reason your stuck state did not change for you as much as you would like do this exercise again continuing stacking up confident resources and bringing them to the stuck state until things change do it again, the exercise over and over until you continue stacking up confident resources and bringing them to the state, to the stuck state until things change. Disassociate, add resources, and act differently. Number one, envision yourself in a stuck situ location. Number two, step out of the stuck location and name three things in the room to balance yourself. Number three, step into the disassociated location and watch how you can resolve the situation in a confident manner by looking at it third party away from yourself. Number four, step into the resource location and think back to a time in your life when you were exuding confidence. Technique 17, matching and mirroring. When two people have rapport with each other, an interesting thing occurs. Their body language becomes similar. They begin to match each other. How can we use this to our benefit? We can consciously match someone else's body language in order to increase our perceived similarity to the person. You can use matching to increase intimacy or almost in any human interaction. This technique is called matching and mirroring because your goal is to become a mirror and image the partner in a conversation. When I first learned this technique, I was confused with it as mimicking. Mimicking is something that younger children do to annoy each other's parents or monkeys do to play with visitors at the zoo. We are not mimicking anything else. Instead, we are increasing our similarity to another person by mirroring that person's body language, which will help engender a greater understanding of his or her points of view. The way you match and mirror someone is to adopt the same body posture that that person has. When the person moves, you must move and hit with him or her. Be sure to allow a certain lag time so that matching does not creep into the person's consciousness awareness. And the idea is to gain rapport at an unconscious level without attracting or notice that you're doing it. The intended effect is that the other person will feel that you are similar to him or her without even being quite sure of why. That the rapport deepnesses, as the rapport deepens, you can trim the lag time and until pretty soon you're moving exactly with the person. Rapport is like a dance. One person leads, the other one follows. Up until this point, you've been involved in the dance and only been following. After sufficient rapport has been established, you have the opportunity to lead the dance of rapport. By begin by leading, moving your body into a new position and seeing if the other person follows you. Now when the person does follow you, you will know that you are now the one in charge and if you move and the person does not allow you to go back to the matching mirroring and build up the rapport further when you lead non-verbally you can match and mirror people in other ways in addition to matching body language you can match a person's breathing too this person will serve the unconscious synchronize this practice will serve to unconsciously synchronize you and another person can faci facilitate rapport to match someone's breathing Watch his or her shoulders. Most people's shoulders rise when inhaling a breath and fall when exhaling. People exhale 
as they are talking. So remember to match someone's breathing as the person speaks to more similarly to you and how another person, even in barely perceptible behavior, such as breathing, the deeper the rapport you will create. As we're matching someone's breathing, you can match hand gestures as well. When another person's talking, notice how he or, her, he or she gestures. No matter whether one is wild, demonstrates gestures, or slight, precise hands using some gestures. I don't care if you feel awkward or it's outside of your comfort zone. You are matching the other person in order to better understand and communicate with him or her. Facial expressions are another great way to match and mirror someone by developing greater rapport. Someone frowning is raising of an eyebrow or another facial expressions can be matched. You can even match someone's muscle tone. If a person's uptight and stressed out, you can tighten yourself up too. If the person's loose and relaxed, you can do the same way to be with him or her in the, mo in the moment. Suppose that you match someone who is tense. You could develop a great rapport with the person and begin to lead the dance rapport gradually by relaxing. If the rapport is sufficient, the person will follow you and relax as well. The level of perceived similarity between you and another person is directly proportioned to the rapport that you will experience. Again, the level of perceived similarity between you and another person is directly proportioned to the rapport that you will experience. The greater level of rapport you experience, the more freedom you will have to relax and be your own confident self around that person. A good rule for of communication is to remember that nobody is going to get a, massage, a message across for you. So do whatever it takes to make sure that you are heard. Nonverbal matching somehow can help facilitate this and increase the chances that your message is received the way you intended it. It's not up to the other person to make sure that he or she gets it. As an excellent communicator, it's solely up to you to share your message loud and clear. Matching and mirroring number one. With a friend, practice mirroring his or her movements. First, adopt the same body postures that the friend has. And next, match your friend's gestures. Third, mirror the friend's facial expressions. And when you are aware of the rapport that has been deepened, try making your own gestures and facial expressions and see if your friend matches your movements. Technique 18. Verbal matching. You now understand how to create rapport by non-verbally matching someone, and of course, you can further deepen rapport by matching someone verbally as well. Typically, verbal behaviors can match our tone, voice, volume, voice, rate of speech, inflection, for example, questioning and manding. The word usage, if someone speaks rapidly, for example, you shouldn't speak much more slowly. You should keep up with that person's speech rate. If someone speaks slowly, you don't want to be a motor mouth when talking with that person. You want to just speak near to the same rate that person is speaking. Listen to people's key words, the words they say over and over again, like they call them a trigger or hot buttons, words from which you hear these words. Use them right back and notice how the rapport skyrockets. My trigger words sprinkled throughout this book, if we, were, if we were to meet and you spoke with me using some more prevalent words in this book, you would notice how delighted I became and more rapport would skyrocket. Some of my trigger words are unstoppable or fun or powerful or delight or awesome. Here's an example of how to match someone's trigger words. The conversation between an artist and her friend, the artist may say, I like my art because it's expressive and freeing. I get, my, I get to be myself and the paint, the paint landscapes there are breathing, are breathtaking and wide open. It allows me to express myself in a way that I didn't get to before. Painting is liberating because I can see the beauty of things around me and express it to others. The friend can match the numerous trigger words by saying, yeah, it makes sense. I understand where you're coming from. It seems like it would be liberating to really lose or express yourself to others, to be able to see a true beauty in things, to point where it takes and how it, gets your, how it takes your breath away. That would be really awesome. I can see why you like painting so much. The result of this communication will be that rapport has deepened because of the trigger words. The painter then discusses her passions of painting, elicits someone's passion, listen to the trigger words, and then use those words when people are, when you're speaking with that person. You will be amazed how much quickly you develop an excellent rapport. Verbal matching. To increase rapport, practice verbal matching with a friend. First, practice your friend's tone and volume of voice. Next, match the rate of speech. Finally, pick up on your friend's trigger words and use them as you respond to what your friend was saying. Technique 19, parroting. Parrots are interesting birds because they repeat certain words or sentences that are used frequently enough. To act like a parrot, you can increase rapport. With someone speaking to pauses, repeat the, flat, the last few words of the sentence right back to that person. The person's word has special significance for him or her, or they wouldn't have even chose to say it that way. Be like a parrot and repeat the exact words back. You'll discover how easily this causes a greater sense of rapport. Parroting validates the person's point of view, and the point of view validated, and they enjoy being listened to, which is why parroting works so well. 
It proves you were listening as a friend. Uh, Fred, for example, Fred and Carolyn. Fred, how are you doing today? Carolyn, excellent. I have a flat tire on the way to work, but I made it here all right. Well, you made it here all right. How has your workday been since that? Well, it's been pretty hectic around my office. I've got a team meeting this afternoon at 4. You've got a team meeting at 4? Uh-huh. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. The product should be unveiled here really soon. Oh, really soon? Yeah, next, next week is our scheduled launch. We've been working really hard to get this project going. Wow, you must have really been working hard to get this project going. The parroting is delivered as a, meter, a mere echo of what the person previously said. With the key points echoed back to the person, the speaker, upon hearing his or her own words parroted back, will either say yes or agree non-verbally, perhaps with a nod. When a person is... When a person... When people are in agreement, they generally are in excellent states of rapport. Avoid acting, avoid active listening, which is when you change around what someone said by putting it into their, into your own words and then spooing it back to that person by changing the words. You change the meaning and distort the true message that the person wanted to convey. People like when they get their message across and parroting their exact words back confirms that you did receive them. So in parroting with a friend, begin conversations and practice repeating the last phrase entirely, word for word, that your friend had said back to him or her. Make sure not to rephrase it in your own words. To rephrase someone's point in, in your own words is considered rude. They want to hear that their point was given across. Technique 20. Nodding. Leaning forward and prodding. People are masterful communicators. Nods are the listening to others. They're doing so. They invite others to relax and share whatever's on their mind. The next time you're talking with someone, continually nod to open the person up for sharing. To practice this, get a partner and have a conversation. Say as little as possible. Nod as often as you can. And this will effectively commu This is what effective communicators do. And by nodding effectively, communicators, your communication, and your confidence in interpersonal skills will dramatically increase by nodding often. Disinterested communicators lean back and slouch. Excellent communicators lean forward and show that they are hanging on every word that you said. In this exercise, lean forward and as you nod along, as you're talking with your partner, prod him or her on by throwing in following phrases at the appropriate pauses. Again, when talking with your partner, prod him or her by throwing in the following phrases at an appropriate pause. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Go on. Oh, go on. Go on. I understand. Oh, I understand. I understand. What makes sense? Oh, that makes sense. Oh, that makes sense. Tell me more. Oh, well, tell me more. I see what you're saying. Oh, I see what you're saying. Oh, I hear you. Yeah, I hear you. Well, that feels right to me. Well, that feels right to me. You'll soon discover how effectively this keeps people talking. I've kept people talking for 30 minutes at a time without me saying anything. Just by nodding, leaning forward, and interjecting these phrases at the appropriate times. Nodding, learning, forward, nodding, leaning forward, and prodding. Ask a friend to begin telling you a story. Practice nodding and prodding at appropriate points in the story and see how long you can keep your friend talking. Technique 21. Ask open-ended questions. When you realize that you can talk to anyone, anywhere, anytime, you will have more confidence in yourself than ever before. The secret to being a great conversationalist is knowing what to ask questions that show genuine interest in the other person. Quite simply, ask open-ended questions whenever possible. Open-ended questions require more than a simple yes or no response. The person answering has to elaborate and describe what he or she is thinking. Closed questions do not further develop conversations since they are usually followed by short answers. If someone repeatedly responds to you with one word answers, there's not much work with the developing the conversation. An example of closed questions and responses, Brad, how are you doing today? Fine. An example of open-ended question response is, if anything were possible, what would most likely what would you most like to do right now? Well, I have a passion of sailing. I would love to be sailing in my boat around the world with my friends. I've been sailing before and I love it. I can't wait to go again. So you can see how asking an open-ended question and a closed question elicits entirely different responses. Now, as you ask these open-ended questions, be sure to listen intently to what the person is saying. While you are listening to someone, use the other methods taught to you in this book to develop an even greater rapport. You can nod and lean forward, parrot the person's words back to him or her, use nonverbal matching and mirroring, and using trigger words, doing all this at once, you may be, 
you might be cumbersome at first, but therefore practicing each skill individually and then when you've mastered them all, begin to combine them for an even better rapport with others. Ask open-ended questions. Engage a friend in a conversation. Ask open-ended questions and see how long that you can keep the conversation going. Chapter 14, Your Confident Future. Whatever we expect with confidence becomes our self-fulfilling prophecy. Brian Tracy. This chapter contains a few final pieces of advice to get you on your way, and once you've started, make sure you don't stop. Build your community. As your confidence grows, others will notice the change within you and perhaps behave differently than before, and that's normal. They are used to you acting in a particular way, and then you, when you, different, when then you behave differently, they may not have a pattern for interacting with you anymore. They will adapt to your newfound confidence and develop an affinity for it. When I first began breaking out of my shell, I was concerned about how others would treat me. Much to my delight, they seemed to enjoy being around me a little bit more thoroughly as a direct result of my increased confidence. Family and friends. Enlist the support of your family and friends to help you on your confidence journey. When they are behaving in a confident manner, they can, accomp they can compliment you and reinforce your behavior. Tell them that you would appreciate their support as you do these confident exercises. Similarly, if they catch you falling into an old shy habit, they can politely point it out for you, which means that you can immediately correct that behavior. Some people may have a negative reflection to your enhanced confidence and zest for life, and they are not genuine friends. Your genuine friends want the best for you, and anything less means that you're not a true friend. And if someone tries to criticize your increased confidence, view this as an opportunity to test your confidence and let that criticism bounce right off you without even making an impact. Learning unstoppable confidence with others is in addition, I recommend meeting regularly with others like-minded people to teach unstoppable confidence to others to increase your own confidence. Let this book serve as a guide or help group help your group does confident exercises with each other. Getting together with other people can be an incredible powerful way to ratchet up your confidence. You can support each other on the journey to a greater success and when you get together with confidence you can talk about situations that when you were confident and other situations where you need more confidence. Others may have insights that haven't occurred to you yet and you might be able to help them likewise. Meet with people and people on a regular basis, once a month maybe would be great, harness the power of a synergy. That is the concept of the whole greater than the sum of parts. In the case of this confidence group, the entire group's intelligence exceeds that of each individual's intelligence summed up. The whole group would become as, each member would become as intelligent as all of the intelligence summed up. Take action now. Your power lies in the present. That means you need not cast out procrastination and do it now, whatever it may be. I cannot emphasize this point strongly enough. Dismith, dismiss. It can wait until later. Mentality right now. The sooner you adopt the do it now attitude, the do it now, do it now, do it now attitude, the sooner you will create a better relationship, more fun in life to fulfill your dreams. The reason doing this as soon as you can possibly can is easier than procrastinating is because of the psychic weight of the things that are put off if you typically procrastinate on something you may not think to yourself I should I should be doing that instead of this then you might talk to yourself and doing it later meanwhile the leisure activity which you were supposed to be enjoying is now consequently ruined because your mind is preoccupied with what you should be doing that is why we do it now mentality is so powerful it's really much easier to set up and finish tasks than it is to free from your obligations enjoy yourself in your favorite leisure activities the greater equalizer among us is that in each and every day we all have the same 24 hours to invest everyone rich or poor 24 hours here we go most people don't think of their time as an investment but once you spent it today's 24 hours you can never get them back ever people endlessly hang out wasting time without realizing that it is time that is never to be recaptured I'm all for leisure and spending quality time with friends and loved ones my main objective is to is towards people who are acting without purpose or rather being inactive without purpose if people consciously choose how they spend their time that is fine to maximize your use of time survey your life Find out what wastes your time and eliminate it so you can spend more time doing what you thoroughly enjoy. If something is unbearable to you, hire someone else to do it. Or perhaps trade responsibilities with a friend, partner, or a spouse. It all comes down to this simple message. Do more of what you like and less of what you don't. The following is an exercise to discover how to invest your time. When you finish it, the result might surprise you. Go through the results and eliminate your time wasters. Maximize doing what you love and you'll find yourself being more efficient in the following in the following weeks. Since you will know what tasks consume large chunks of your time, what tasks can be delegated? Number one, 
for an entire week, write down what you are doing every half hour. Number two, after the end of the week, notice how you spend most of your time and what you're doing. Number three, ask yourself how easily you can eliminate time wasting activities. Number four, ask yourself what you can invest more time on in your activities that will lead you closer to your goals. And finally, schedule your next week according to what you've discovered. And as you continue to use your time ever more wisely and productively, notice that this increases your confidence. The more actions you take, the more dreams come true, the more motivated you'll feel and do and achieve even more. The proper fruit of knowledge is action. Action. Take action. Reap the full benefits of your knowledge. Stay on track with your confidence and practice a calendar. One method to stay on track as you develop your ability to be confident is a confident practicing calendar. You can take an extraordinary calendar and schedule which confident exercises you will do on a particular day. You can also set up milestones that will accept that you expect to achieve that journey towards unstoppable confidence and compare your progress against them. One day you could practice speaking confidently. The next day an exercise you'll be walking confidently. The following day exercise gesturing confidently. Going through this book Pick out your favorite exercise and put them down on the calendar. Create your calendar and match your personality. You'll know what will work best for you. Positive reinforcement is a great motivator. There I recommend you that you praise yourself when you find that you're behaving confidently. Although you may not think it's a big corny, a bit corny, I know I did it first, but I found that following reinforcement method really worked. And when I found myself behaving in a way I wanted and I gave myself small applause, I pat myself on the back or a self-hug, many people deny themselves their due credit, even when they perform extraordinarily. Give yourself credit by consciously reinforcing your positive behavior. After all, who's the only person you are guaranteed to be with 24 hours a day for the rest of your life? You are, of course. Treat yourself well. Discover how your unconscious mind rec responds. As you treat yourself better, you'll discover how you're able to access parts of your memory that you hadn't before. You're able to visualize better. Your, your negative internal dialogue will disappear. Many people do not treat themselves very well. They have a nagging internal dialogue making their lives miserable. They think that people are out to get them. People, causes the cause, people are causes in their lives, not effects. Disempowered people let things happen to them. Empowered people make things. When people take complete responsibility for their own lives, they become empowered. Empowered. They realize that they always have a choice. They can act out consciously decisions instead of blaming others and playing a victim role. They can realize that they always will have a choice. They can act out conscious decisions. When you're empowered and acting out of a choice, celebrate your accomplishments by rewarding yourself. Reward yourself in the same way you'd reward your best friend. His or her, her accomplishments. Remind yourself that you are wonderful. Sometimes people don't celebrate their accomplishments. They stall or wait for others to do it. Or maybe they wanted permission to celebrate or what they did. I'm not giving my permission. I'm not giving my permission for you to celebrate all of your successes. I'm now giving you permission to, for you to celebrate all of your successes. Live a healthy life. Because in order to be unstoppably confident, you must lead a healthy, fulfilling life. There's three components that essentially to leading a such a flexibility is a sense of humor and an orientation towards the future. Leading such as a life of flexibility and a sense of humor. Flexibility, if you have flexibility in life, you'll have enough choices to be able to do whatever it takes to achieve your outcome. If something does not work, you'll have a with a wear or withal to realize that it's not working and admit your behavior. In other words, use flexibility until you eventually get your results. The more flexible people are, the more likely they will get what they want. There is a law of cybernetics. Which is the science of effective organization that states the person component, the person or component with the most choices in the system wins. Take a negotiation, for example. If someone has many options and the op opposition has few, the first party has an upper hand. The fewer options you have, the less empowered you are. Maximize your empowerment by being flexible and having many options and choices, as you can imagine. A sense of humor. Having a sense of humor is essential in life. It means that you won't take things too seriously or blow them off as blow them out of proportion. I'm sure we all know people who take everything too seriously and end up having health problems or smoking or drinking or as an escape from their problems. The more useful way of experiencing life is maybe laughing your way through it. When times are the toughest and you are completely stressed out, the ability to laugh out loud is truly priceless. Laughing out loud will help you center you, which will lead you into a more resourceful, problem-solving state of mind. People are excessively seriously serious and overly and overly formal. 
and it, it tends to have, they tend to get ulcers and heart attacks, strokes, and other medical maladies because they choose to allow themselves to, do, to get stressed out. People who laugh a lot, they're a lot healthier and live a lot longer. Be sure to keep your sense of humor as you continue on through your life's journey. Future orientation. There are three different ways that we can explain that we can orient ourselves with respect to time. The past, the present, the future. Each can be a useful outlook, having strong orientation for the best path of living our life's dream. The past can be useful for summoning positive resources from earlier periods in your life, for gathering and tapping into experience, for example. Some people who are heavily oriented towards the past virtually live into the bygone glory days, however, continually rehashing them through the storytelling of other reminiscence. Focusing solely on the past makes it easier for you not to take any action towards building the future. People who get overly caught up in the present orientation live entirely in the moment, fail to plan for the future, and flawed outlooks can be in a direct consequence. These people want immediate gratification without having to think about the negative effects of their decisions. A certain amount of present time orientation is to great to cherishing each moment of your life and allowing the spontaneity to provide that you still plan for the future. The ideal orientation is to balance the future and the present together. The ideal mental orientation from now on is to balance the future and the present together knowing what you want for the future planning for it, and taking action while enjoying yourself along the way is the ultimate ideal and ideal to strive for you're constantly living and thinking about the future while still living and enjoying yourself on the way and by delaying instant gratification by delaying instant gratification and having patience and diligence working towards your goals as you thrive in the present moment you will still have the ideal time orientation combination when you find the balance that works best for you you'll know it life is short and we don't know what tomorrow holds but we can plan for a wonderful future while we make the most of today plan for the future while making the most of today you can achieve your dreams when you take action and work your plan and life goes by so quickly that we must remind ourselves to cherish each and every moment getting going and don't stop with your unstoppable confidence, you're going to want to tackle the world at once. When you consider all of what you want and you can achieve in your lifetime, you might want to go out and do it all right now. You can tackle the world, of course, but you should do it in a progressive stage, in progressive stages. You will have so many dreams and passions awaken that you may be, it might seem overwhelming. Sometimes, when people feel overwhelmed, they do nothing because they don't know where to begin. We'll avoid letting this happen to you. Consider your most important immediate goals and pursue those first. Remember to take action each and every day, and no matter how much or how little things begin, brings you closer to fulfilling your goals. A journey of thousand miles begins with a single step. Focus on taking the next step every day. Beware though that if you focus on all the next action, that if you focus on the next action as part of a larger goal, you may lose sight of what you're going after and the goal in the first place. The ideal here is to have a balance. Keep the big picture in mind, remembering what's important for you and to you about the goal and why you're even doing it as you focus on small steps that actually get you there taking action each and every day being unstoppably confident means being proactive being proactive being proactive decide what you want go after it and get it some people say someday it'll happen for me no 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 or I'm waiting for my lucky break the problem is that those reactive people are waiting forever resourceful people resourceful people make it happen luck is where preparation meets opportunity be prepared for relentlessly pursuing the opportunities that you'll surprise yourself at how lucky you become go out there go out there and make it happen because you are unstoppable appendix qualities to alter your experience and your beliefs you can work on altering your experiences by focusing on the following qualities visual qualities is color is the image in color or black and white size how big or small is the image detail how detailed is the image focus is it clear how clear is the image contrast do the elements of the image contrast brightness how bright or dull is the image border is there a border around the image distance how near or far away is the image to you shape which shape is the image location where is the image located perspective from which vantage point do you view the image dimension is the image flat or three-dimensional movement is the image fixed or is it a movie or is it a movie playing auditory qualities location where's the sound coming from tonality what's the tonality like depth does the sound surround you volume how loud or quiet is the sound melody is the sound melodic or monotonous duration is the sound continuous or intermittent intermittent sensory qualities intensity how intense is the feeling location where do you feel the feeling 
Speed, how fast does the feeling occur? Duration, is the feeling continuous or intermittent? Quality, how would you describe the feeling? Unstoppable confidence, power to use, how to use the power of NLP, NLP to be more dynamic and successful by Kent Sayer. If you're serious about gaining more confidence, you must get this book, Robert G. Allen, The One Minute Millionaire. This book will give you a boost toward success that can make all the difference. Brian Tracy, best-selling author of Maximum Achievement. Imagine having the confidence and courage to go after goals, successful careers, rewarding relationships, richer, fuller life. If you could dream it, you could do it. Using the scientific methods of neuro-linguistic neuro programming, NLP, through NLP, author Kent Sayer transformed himself from a plainfully shy introvert into one of the nation's most dynamic NLP trainers. He's taught thousands how to break out of their shells and go after their dreams. Now, with this proven system, you too can harness the power of NLP to blast out of your comfort zone, shatter your limiting beliefs, and boost your confidence instantly. The step-by-step -step program for ready-to-use tool, verbal, nonverbal techniques, and practical thinking exercises will redirect your mind towards your goals. You'll be amazed how easy it is to interact with others, embrace opportunities, and enjoy social events, activities, and work functions. Unstoppable confidence.